You know what's funny about all those clappings I just did, Stephen? What? It, it's what I did in Israel at Google. I, I Because you weren't there. Oh, and, I watched it. Yeah, well, you watched You just edited it. Yeah. And it's going to be up by the time people watch this. But I went in and I had to do the two angles myself, mm-hmm. which meant I had to let them run. I didn't have atomoses, and I had to reset them at 20 minutes. But then I'm like... Well, how do I make this fun? How do I make it so that people are feeling like they're part of something and I'm not just stopping the whole show? Which I literally had to do to reset the cameras. So I was like, I'll just have everybody clap for me. Uh, do a single clap so that it made your job. Did it make your job easier? It did make it easier, but then there was like, it wasn't all uniform in the beginning. Like it was kind of like <laughs> clap, clap, you know, like 30 claps at once. I tried to, ma- I couldn't do my oh, shloch. Lachach. Yeah, I, and you did it in in Hebrew yeah, once. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> because they helped me. My, my Hebrew. And, you know, well, Toward well, the end, you had it down, though, because you did it. You re- we reset the cameras three four times. Or five times. Oh, yeah, four or five times. Because it was about an hour long lecture. It, it worked out. It was good. Yeah. Um, you guys can check out that video. We'll put it up on fronosphoto.com slash raw talk. Uh, r- what was it? Was it raw talk hyphen eighty six? Okay, We're on good. Now, right? All right, let, yeah. let's let me get into my intro here. <laughs> Jared Poland, Fronos Photo.com, and welcome to Raw Talk episode number 86. And I'm calling it Israel, the best trip I ever had. At least that's probably what I'm going to call it. So, we've got a pretty busy show this week. Uh, a lot of people want to hear about the Israel trip and why I was there and what was it all about. So I'm going to talk about that after we get through photo news, but we also have an interview with Ziv Koren. It's, he spells his last name K-O-R-E-N. He is a war photographer. We'll call him a photojournalist who so happened to, as he would say, be in the right place at the right time when certain things happened. More uh, like an, an extreme bad things, photojournalist. Bad things. Yeah. I mean, he was bus bombings in Israel. I believe part of the interview, he talks about um, in 90 when we went to war, we went to war. Yeah. The U.S. went to war with Iraq, and the Scud missiles being fired by Saddam Hussein into Israel, they weren't... It was unbelievable things. Like, we weren't scared. He's like, only one person died, and he died of a heart attack. And A heart oh, attack. Wow. Right. Nobody died because the missiles just landed in streets. So that was his opportunity. He went out there, and he was doing photojournalistic work of where they landed and stuff like that. You're going to hear all of these stories, but he's put him in, himself into such tough situations. He has to wear full flak jackets. He's wearing helmets. But that's when he's going into war-torn situations. He also travels around the world and does stuff. He's a canon ambassador. Uh, So he, you'll hear all about that. There's there's a lot to talk about. um, And I'm going to get to everything about Israel. I have a whole, I have literally two, two sheets of, of, uh, of notes here because it's, there was so much to talk about. Yeah. Um, How was your week? Good. Um, I spent pretty much the week editing, and I also had our big birthday show for the radio station, which went pretty well. Um, I photographed for like 12 hours straight. My feet killed and my biceps hurt after the day, but... You need to work out, bro. <laughs> it worked out, though. I mean, um, it, I, I got the full set for each song, each band, which was great, except one band, which I will uh, leave unnamed. What band was it? <laughs> one of my favorites, actually. Third Eye Blind, for some odd reason, oh, only EB. let me do... The first three songs, which kind of doesn't make sense because there was a little, uh, there was much bigger names on the bill, and well, they, they they do that at the radio show all the time. They have they have four like newer, yeah, acts more and modern one older acts exactly, act. just well, to kind of help. You know, it, it really breaks up the audience a little bit. Did they do motorcycle drive by? Uh, I don't think so, but I had my earplugs in the whole time. You know, when you're when you're in like shooting mode, you just don't even pay attention to what songs are yeah, playing at the time. That's but true. But that's my personal favorite song from Third Eye Blind. What was that? Where she did like her nose was bleeding because she did a lot of coke or something. Uh, no, you, I think you're thinking semi charm life. No, 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 no. I'm not thinking. Motorcycle drive by where I'm so uh, I'm so alive. That one. Oh, I don't know, but they, so many hits off of their albums. Yeah. So but especially many. the debut. So many. Like six singles came off that one. Noise. We'll have to get you a, a Squarespace one day set up. <laughs> <laughs> one day, dude. One, one day. day. You're drinking Monster. Is it? Yeah. The only Monster I ever drank was at South by Southwest. It was black can with blue writing. That's like the, the sugar-free one, I think, no, or the low-carb one? No, it was monster water. What? It was plain water in a monster can. Oh. You, I, you just put it in yourself? No. What? No, they make monster... They made, or I don't know if they still do, it's, it was no added anything. It was literally water 
in a monster can because not everybody wants to drink that crap. I actually enjoy this, the coffee one, a lot because it doesn't taste like it's like an energy drink. It tastes like a coffee drink. I have honestly, and I'm a coffee guy, never drank a Red Bull, never tasted a Red Bull, never drank a monster, never had an all star, never had a Nas, never had Nas any of those is terrible. drinks. I uh, monster would you guys like to be a sponsor they love throwing <laughs> money around too yeah I know for extreme stuff but anyway um good week yeah it was Let, a good let's week. check with Sutter <laughs> crickets, <laughs> crickets. <laughs> Sutter uh, I contacted him he's like I didn't know you were back from Israel I am assisting on a photo shoot I'm like well all right well that's a good thing you're assisting on a photo shoot that's what you're supposed to be doing yeah so that's where Sutter is this week and that means I have to remember to reset some cameras. Yeah, basically, we're doing his job, which is resetting the cameras. And he helps a lot, too, setting up. Yeah. uh, And the initial and the breakdown, too, as well. And one day, well, while we're at it, while we're at it, I'll talk about the Atomoses because they they asked me to talk about the Ninja Star, Mm -hmm. which would come in handy, would have come in handy for me in Israel. Oh, yeah. Ninja Star is the new small one. They wrote, what? It's like the size of a GoPro. It's three ounces and three inches. That would be the smallest penis in the world if that was (laughs) yours. Um, And, And it's not even an inch thick, right? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> let's check with Sutter on that one. Oh, oh he's not here. Burn. Sick. Well, let's check with his girlfriend. Oh, oh, she's not here. Burn. <laughs> um, no, anyway, <laughs> the Ninja Star would have helped me in Israel. It's small. It's light. It's compact. And it packs a major punch, though. Uh, super small and lightweight. Three ounces, three inches. High quality recording from center. They wrote here, MPEG Assassin, exclamation Ooh. point, exclamation point. Uh, records to CFast cards, which are the newer. It's a new for it, It's like this is what I equated to. You have your XQD cards, which are solid state Sony cards, right? Mm-hmm. It's literally the CFast card is based off of the same type of thing, just in a different size. So it's not reverse compatible with Compact Flash. It uses the CFast cards, which are much, much faster. Um, so I can't wait to get a couple of those for this stuff. Uh, and we looked see. up uh, the hub adapters too for the Lexar hub. Which, by the way, you and I were looking at the Lexar hub yesterday on on B and H. Yeah, and it was forty five dollars. Yeah, on sale uh, from seventy nine ninety nine. And it said on B and H, it said like only minus ten dollars savings. So I guess initially, I guess now it's uh, like fifty five bucks. Or it was just a sale going on. And yeah, but then on Lexar's site it says seventy nine ninety nine. I don't know. Maybe they're replacing it. Maybe they're doing something else. But maybe they're blowing it out. I love it. Yeah, me too. Anyway, it's not about Lexar. We're still talking about Atomos. <laughs> Perfect for action cams or drone helicopters as well as those users uh, wanting a recorder but they uh, doesn't necessarily necessarily require a screen which is exactly what I could have used in Israel so during my interview with Ziv and during my Google talk uh, where 200 of the uh, our Israel readers showed up which is freaking awesome um, it would have meant I could have just let it run yeah now in here we talked about this what would it what would the difference be if we started using those on two of the cameras uh, really just the file storage I mean it, it takes probably 25 gigs per camera to about 100 gigs per camera because of the ProRes so LT 25 if we use the SD card or HQ whatever we want to end up encoding with but yeah it's it's just a lot more I think it's probably going to be worth it it's going to be another step in the right direction it is but if we do what you were talking about before the black magic live switcher kind yeah. of setup that'll only that'll all export into one atomos final recording pretty much which will end up being just one big file versus three or four separate individual files I may have to sense. give you the phone number to the uh, the black magic people yeah because that would be great if we did something like that and it would just save a ton of time right um I Oh, yeah. What's the one we're using now? We switched. They sent oh, it back. Oh, yes. So we're now on the Atomos Blade. The Blade, which the blade. I can sit here and look at the screen and actually see it, where with the Atomos, uh, what was the old one? The Ninja? The Ninja 2. The Ninja 2, which is still a great recorder for the value. Oh, yeah. But this screen on here is like having a phone screen up there. It, it's literally, it reminds me of like a bigger iPhone screen as far as the calibration goes. It's it's perfect it actually matches the back of the screen which our issue before was the ninja 2 wasn't really perfectly calibrated to the back of the screen where this one is great and we now have the um what else do we have the focus peaking enabled which the ninja 2 has as well but it was always kind of so basically we had to send it back they sent it to us to review and then they ran out they sold out of them and they needed our unit Mm -hmm. to show at nab yeah in la so or in los angeles las vegas so they finally sent it back so that's why we're using it all right and just finishing up on that the touchscreen is much more sensitive too it's it's way better it's just Mm. really easy it's 10 percent more sensitive 10 percent more sensitive their touchscreen don't quote me on that but it is 20% 20% more sensitive. <laughs> and it takes the same and hard drives and all that. Three inches and three ounces. <laughs> oh, wait, not that one. All right. Anyway, so that's uh, uh, Atomos. Thank you, guys. Uh, Fios. My Fios is in. 
my uh, Verizon files. It's been a year I've been trying to get them into my building. You have been finally forever. they are in and it's installed. And I my download speeds, which I tested on my computer and my iPhone through my Apple Airport Extreme, by the way, because they're the modems and routers that come with these companies. I tested it. I got nine down and like eight up. Yeah, it's always crap. It's such. Cr- why are you gonna have such great speeds but such shitty? And they make you buy. Like I gotta buy that router. For like ninety nine bucks or yeah, something, you have to. Maybe it's one ninety. I got to buy it or I got to rent it for four ninety nine a month, which is such crap. I, I swear they cap them too, so it only reaches a certain amount of limit. So you like get the next package up or something. Well, but but what ended up happening is uh, I bought my Apple Airport Extreme, and the speed I'm getting out of that is eighty three megabytes down, megabits down, and thirty eight up. That's great. So I'm paying for seventy five thirty five and getting eighty three thirty eight, which is unbelievable upload speeds we did a six gig file to youtube as a test here my google talk that we did six gig file it said well it maybe took 20 minutes to upload and maybe another 15 minutes or 20 minutes to process yeah it, unbelievable how it, quick it, it was, was like an hour altogether. and i have comcast now my download is 100 download um and only 10 upload right which my upload used to be 10 as well yeah. with comcast and that just it took it takes you what four or five hours to upload raw talk no it only takes about two hours to upload raw talk but the processing just takes right. forever it I depends on how the day is for youtube for if it's a busy ever. day forever you actually get that reference sandlot yay steven got a <laughs> reference steven got a reference steven got a reference <laughs> you got a reference buddy all right, so thank you. Before we jump in the photo news, we should just jump in the photo news. I'm gonna, okay. s- I'll save this talk, this, uh, this one little piece. Or do I want to talk about it now? Yeah, we'll talk about this on the uh, the next part. Sounds so, good. Stephen, it's time for photo news, which still doesn't have a song. <laughs> Eight nine months later. Uh, yeah, a bunch of new lenses announced this week. Nikon unveiled the new AFS 400 millimeter f2.8 e FLED VR lens. <sighs> Uh, it comes complete with a built-in 1.4 times teleconverter, which is nice. It has, to, I guess, it's competing with that Canon one. No, it doesn't. The 200 to 400. This doesn't have a built-in teleconverter. Oh, I'm sorry. It they announced a <laughs> 1.4 times teleconverter with it. Uh, the downfall is that it'll cost you 12 grand, uh, which is about three grand more than its predecessor. Um, now, like I was saying, they also announced a standalone teleconverter, the 1.4 times teleconverter, the AFS TC 14E3. Uh, the lens will start shipping in August, along with that standalone teleconverter. So, for those wishing to dish out, dish out twelve grand, you can do it in August. Twelve thousand dollars for a lens. That's, um, uh, I'd rather rent it. Uh, you could rent it, but don't forget if you're a pro shooter and you're doing sports and you're doing that type of stuff that requires that you're lens, making that you're kind making of money. that kind of money. Yeah. The thing is, it's also two pounds lighter, I believe. Oh, is than it than the original? The, well, then the last model, so they've made it lighter, which means it's going to be better and sharper and easier to carry around. I mean, two pounds, is that's a lot of weight yeah. to shave off of it. Oh, yeah. Uh, and the teleconverter, teleconverters can only get sharper and better as they as they go. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a big fan of teleconverters. but I, I personally despise teleconverters, uh, at least my Canon one that I have. Uh, I think I have the 2X one, and I use it on occasion on my 70 focus. to 200. Slow focus. Brings me down to F4. Clarity goes, well, no, 2X brings you down to 5.6. You're right, 5.6. And it just keeps getting worse yeah. quality. Yeah, it's it's only needed in those situations where even 200 is way too far Situations? Away. Situations. Situations. Now, Canon also announced a, a few new lenses. They revealed the EF 16-35 F4L IS USM lens, which will be great for you know run and gun video kind of stuff, super stabilized. Um, the IS will give you about four stops of shake reduction. I swear it just gets better and better every year. Um, it'll also cost about 1200 bucks. Would it stop the Harlem shake, though? <laughs> I don't know. Who knows? Roughly about $500 cheaper than the non-stabilized 2.8 version. But this is a great, great lens for a very affordable option. I mean, F4... No, 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 no. Take I wouldn't that back. mind it. Back up. Very affordable. $1,299? i am saying 1200 Okay. Versus but- the 1700 I, I, I would gladly take this option over the 2.8, uh, probably because of the what IS What about alone. the music shooting? Well, yeah, I understand that. But the IS alone, well, I don't really mind it. But the IS is not compensating enough for if they're moving fast and you no, got to bump the, the ISO. Wise, yeah. So Nikon has a 16 to 35 f4 VR. Nikon already has one of those. Canon just came out with it. Obviously, we're starting to understand that run and gun video, where you're hand holding 
the IS becomes really important and the aperture really isn't because as much as an important thing because you're not shooting at 2.8 because you can't track the freaking focus with yeah. it. It's that hard. So your F4, if you make it an IS and you're shooting at 5.6 or something like that, it's going to make your images for video a hell of a lot more stable so that's pretty cool yeah and when you're already at 16 millimeters fully wide it still takes barely you know the slightest little shake doesn't do much so with the is it's going to be super super stabilized i'll switch the cameras i got it you you keep doing your news all right i'll keep doing it um so they also unveiled the efs 10 to 18 millimeter f4 to 5.6 for those with uh, crop sensors uh that'll cost around 300 dollars, which means it'll probably be like a piece of plastic with a with a glass on the end um and as a side note the white rebel st1 camera is also now available in the u.s for about 750 dollars um i don't know who would specifically want that one uh, but yeah, if you're into that kind of stuff, then then go ahead. Uh, more gear news. Nikon released a firmware update for the D800 and the D800E. The 1.1 update corrects a bunch of issues. Uh, more custom settings added. Support for CF cards greater than 128 gigabytes. First uh, off, why are you going to put 100? And don't you like that I well, have to reset video, the cameras? What? Well, because then I can't say a word when I'm resetting it's the cameras. Not yeah, there's no interruptions. We need the Atomo so I can continue to interrupt <laughs> you while they reset. No, we reset. just need Sutter. True, he can do that. Yeah, um, but now they all—they had, like I said, the support for the CF cards greater than 128 gigabytes. I guess for those shooting an insane amount of video in one time, which I think you would want to keep backing it up instead of using a one 128 gig card in case there's any corruption issues or anything like that. Um, memory card light issue was fixed. Apparently, there was something where the light would stay on a lot longer than needed, and it would basically force you to not really move on until that light stopped. They fixed that issue. Um, many more issues resolved. Now the download links are all over on the website. There's like a UK download link and a US website uh, link if you want to check them out. And then moving forward to some sad news, a 26-year-old French photojournalist, Camille Lepage, has been killed while covering the conflicts over in uh, Central African Republic. Now, no word on how she died, but her body was found by French peacekeepers in a car that was driven by Christian militia fighters. Uh, the French presidency has released a statement saying, all means necessary will be used to shed light onto the circumstances of this murder and to find her killers. And the UN Security Council, Council as well uh, also commented, um, basically saying that this is a call for an immediate investigation into her death and they're going to look into it and check it out. You know, it, it's horrible. It is. It's, you know, she put herself there as a photojournalist. She did, yeah. It's very similar to what Ziv does when he goes to Africa and does things like... I don't know that he's don't, gone into that type thing. I just get... L they're always fighting. They've been fighting. Oh, yeah. Right? Africa, the, it, certain the nations, there's always these bad things going on and obviously never good when anybody gets killed but when you start getting the government and the UN oh we're going to find their killers and stuff like they're at war it's just like did any uh, I'm not yeah, going to get into Yeah but she was also a part the, of the press I don't want to get into the political side of it It's always the press are supposed to be the the it ones doesn't not ma but it doesn't matter when she's it's embedded It's chaotic war yeah be like she's embedded it, it's like I've heard a, fo a photographer story that he was embedded with the uh, Iraqi uh, soldiers during one of the uh, wars and he was he was basically I think he was kidnapped so he was kidnapped by the Republican oh, Guard get kidnapped. well the Republican Guard yeah all right and that's there the Republican Guard was was Saddam Hussein's uh, elite army force he was kidnapped they were pinned down by the American forces and he they were getting fired on he was being held he, it's not like he could run to the other side he was reloading ammunition for them into reloading ammunition and handing it to them because he knew it was his only chance to survive and get out of there, mm -hmm. which he ended up obviously getting out of there. But sh could you imagine that? No. I mean, he could have been killed by friendly fire, but he was kidnapped. They didn't know he was there. And he was he's like, I had a choice. I could not help them and they'd get run over and killed and I would end up being killed or we could just I, I it's tough, horrible situation. Anytime you're going to put yourself into I don't know that I would ever have the balls to put myself I, into I that. I personally couldn't, but... Um, and, and I hope they find who ended up doing it, oh, but sure. I'm not justifying that war means you can do whatever you want. I'm just pointing out that there's been how many other people murdered that live there. No, I understand. You know what I'm saying? And I'm photo news. I know. I'm trying to... I'm not yelling. <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure I don't get caught in a political statement. Yeah, it's, it's hard to talk about these things without pissing somebody off. Some I'm just... To, I'm just to, the only point I was trying to make is that there's so many other people that have been murdered and killed there. And then when they start making a statement like we're going to bring them to justice, 
they should have been doing that for many, many years for other things. Yeah, I agree. But it sucks. It's it a horrible suck. thing. Um, moving forward, this is really neat. A new interactive web app called the Application Shortcut Mapper. Have you seen this? Nine. Really cool stuff. So uh, low. <laughs> low I, means no in Hebrew. I was assuming that. And and um, and then you got you got okay you got low, and Ken. Is that, you know how many times I said Ken? Is that yes? Yes. And 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 they were ripping on me. They're like Ken, Ken. You know, well because of Ken, but still. Anyway, so there's Ken and Lo, and then there's Fababa, which is awesome. And then I learned what Botnim. Botnim is peanuts. <laughs> I can, and then I can't get I can't get the uh, the almonds right. It was like Shek Sheknim or Sheknim. Well, you know me, I probably wouldn't have been able to pronounce anything over there. Well, I was just trying to learn some Hebrew. Yeah. Yala lech. Let's did, go. Did you know anything Hurry. prior to going over there? Toda roba. Thank that, you very much. Oh. <laughs> All right, keep going. I um, sidetracked you. But speaking of, I, I saw a note here. Did you see my tan? I guess that's a tan, right? <laughs> I don't know. It's sort of some color. <laughs> I've been getting a tan from running uh, lately. Well, if you consider it a tan, I kind of got a farmer's tan going on. Yeah. I got the Irish red. You got some color, bro. A little bit, a little bit. Um, anyway, moving on to this next story. So like I was saying, a new interactive web app. It's called the Application Shortcut Mapper. It showcases what shortcuts are possible via Photoshop and Lightroom. Um, so instead of your stand you know, standalone like keyboard overlay skin. The website displays a keyboard on the screen which interacts in real time with your own keyboard. So when you push down, say, a certain key like control, it shows the various different shortcuts used in conjunction with that key. That's cool. It lights up on the screen. Um, it works with Mac-based systems uh, as well as PC. It also lets you choose which module you'll be in since the shortcuts are different in, say, both like the develop and print module in Lightroom. And same with Photoshop, there's different modules as well that you can choose from. Uh, now, if only someone made like an upgradable like LED skin that works in combination with this website, that'd be really cool. Say so you just like update it every year or so. No, that's pretty cool. I like the fact that it pops up on the screen because if yeah. you don't want to look at the keyboard, you can hit command and then it'd be like, well, all of these come up and then you hit command L. My, my only issue with it from from looking at it for a couple of minutes was that the font, it's really tiny because it's oh. kind of like a it's kind of like a full scale keyboard on the screen. So they put the descriptions really tiny on each key oh. saying what that key. Does. I wouldn't be able to see it. Yeah. Well, yeah, you would have to like blow up the screen like 10 times. <laughs> but that's my only that's what? my only issue with it. Uh, and then moving on an update on that Andy Warhol story that we talked about a few weeks ago. Um, the mini documentary about the recovery process of those lost uh, 41 images that Warhol made with the Amiga software and stored on a floppy disk back in the 80s is now live. Uh, the film interviews members of the team who recovered the images, uh, who explained like the whole process behind it and how they did it. Uh, that pr they pretty much retrofitted these computers from back in the day and decoded the extinct file format to display the images that were previously unviewable. They just went through like lines of code and ended up somehow displaying it. Uh, it comes in at about 20 minutes, and it's definitely like a really interesting watch to check out. Uh, it's funny, too, because they interviewed the two guys behind the computers, I guess, behind that were like setting everything up. I hate to say it, but they were like cliche nerd, nerds. Nerd. Dude. Cliche nerds. Like, <laughs> they're like, well, uh, uh, yeah, the uh, computers, we did this. And like, they weren't like looking at the screen. They weren't even like looking at the camera, like very like, you know, like not sociable. Steven, that is such a stereotype. You're such a stereotype. I'm just, just saying. You're just making fun of people now, aren't you? <laughs> I guess I am in that point. But it's just funny. Revenge of the Nerds. Good movie. Check it out. It is out. a good movie. Uh, let's see. We have photographer Jonathan Keats. He's hidden, one, he's hidden hundreds of pinhole cameras around Berlin that will take 100-year-long exposures. Have you heard about this? No. It's pretty crazy. If all goes as planned, the images will be shown off in 2114 in an exhibit that summer. <laughs> Uh, the cameras are based on traditional pinhole cameras, since Keats says uh, anything complicated is liable to break at some point. Uh, the placement of the cameras will be crowdsourced, though. Basically, anyone who showed up on May 16th and paid about 10 pounds got a camera to take home and place anywhere they want that they think you know, wouldn't be seen or, or taken apart or anything like that. Um, they were told to keep the location secret until old age. Now, who knows if this project will actually succeed, but still a very unique idea, sort of like a <laughs> new age time capsule with an old school technique. But what's going to happen in the long exposure? That's what I don't understand. He was saying, he brought up a, a cool point where um, the, the buildings are going to eventually change, obviously, during that 100 year period. So it's going to be almost like a ghosting effect that's going to happen because it's going to show like the old building when it was there. I want to see the answer now. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to wait till 2114. Yep. 
I want to see what it's going to look like. Now, could somebody CGI this one, <laughs> please? Um, but yeah, I mean, we'll see if uh, if anyone's around no, and we remembers won't see. this specific story. Stephen, hey, we never won't know. see. I might live till I'm 125, maybe. Oh, you're making me sad. <laughs> what? I don't want to think about being gone. We all die at some age. You I know? hate that comfort. I don't like it. Yeah, it's it's scary. It's scary to think about the afterlife. I don't want to think about it. Uh, a Lebanese photographer named I'm gonna try and get this right. Alexi Joffre Frangia. You want to try and get this? Yeah, I'll try. Where's that, that bottom line? Joffrey. Alexi. Wait, wait, wait. You've been watching Game of Thrones? Don't no. say anything because I'm catching up. I haven't. I missed two weeks. I've never watched Game of Thrones, but I should. Alexi Joffre Frangia the guy. All right. I kind of got yeah, that right. When it, when it just add an accent to the stuff. <laughs> and it sounds and right. And then it sounds right. <laughs> So the guy who actually, uh, he custom paints Nikon cameras. You brought that story yeah. up in like, I'll talk like 35. Um, he found out what happened to a Nikon D4 in harsh weather after he left his $6,000 camera out in a heavy storm for over 16 hours. Doing what? What? Did he, what, did, what wait, wait, excuse me. Um, where did I leave my camera? <laughs> did I leave it outside? Well, he was initially setting up uh, for a time lapse at a certain location. Wait, was it going to go like a picture that was going to last until 2014? <laughs> a hundred year old picture. Wait, 21, hundred year long exposure. Um, but and, at, and then in a hundred years, the D57 is out. <laughs> <laughs> the D57. Oh my God. Remember the D4, man? That was a classic camera back in the day. Unbelievable. And on your bookshelf, you'll probably have every single model. Exactly. Showing off. Um, so he was setting up a time lapse. It was at this uh, public park that was apparently closed to the public. Um, it's about 120 what, what miles. Steven, 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 hold on. Mm. How is it a public park if it's closed to the public? Apparently it was closed to the public that day. I okay, don't know that's details. That's better. That, well, that's better. There. You can't say public park that is closed to the public. It just, you said public, it's public. All right, a public park that was closed to the public for on that, that day. day. Now, apparently that location was about 120 miles away from his home. Uh, the weather appeared to be fine and only called for light showers, so he drove back home, only to come back the next day to find out that the area was pretty much poured on. Uh, he also had a Nikon D3S set up as well. Uh, both cameras were still shooting time-lapse photos, but the gear was covered with water, with water even inside the casing. Uh, the crazy part is that after some thorough cleaning and dehumidifying, the gear actually works just like new. Uh, I wonder if he ended up getting anything out of the time-lapse photos, though, um, or if the water on the lenses made them, you know, unusable, the photographs in the end. Got it. Because I didn't see any of the time-lapse, so I guess it didn't work out. Okay. Um, but he had a 1424. The time is okay. You don't have to don't, keep looking. I'm just looking. You're distracting me by looking. Don't be distracted. It's not your job. That's why I'm looking at you're the camera. You're telling me when you're the one that gets distracted. Squirrel! Well, first <laughs> off, now that you bring that up, there was a funny thing in Israel. They don't have squirrels, but they have cats. Really? So it's like a cat would walk by and be like, cat! <laughs> cat! Were they like big cats or like no, tiny cats? No, the thing that you notice about the cats in Israel, it made me realize that everybody's fat in America. The people are fat. The cats are fat. The dogs are fat. Why? Because every cat I saw was slim, like in shape. Such good pussy, man. The pussy like <laughs> crawled up on my lap and just <laughs> sat there and let me pet it. It was unbelievable. No, it was so good in in, in in Getty, which is like an oasis uh, at the Dead Sea, which I'll talk about later. But this kitty was just there, and it was just like, pss, 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 and it was like petting and it was purring. The kitty, kitty, get over here! So kitty was over there, and then he just then she crawled up on my lap and just fell asleep while I petted it. Petted it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Next. Um. Yeah. Anyway, what I was saying about the fourteen to twenty four lens is that he had it pointed straight up at the sky, and it pretty much just served as like a, a cereal bowl or something. There's just water all inside it. Noise. But it all worked out. Uh, Digital Rev, they put together a funny parody video showcasing how to look like a professional photographer. See this one? No. It's pretty good. Actually, you should have made this video. You would have loved making this video. It's kind of like an 80s jazzercise video theme that they had going on. And a couple of tips include the, the clothing that you should wear, which he's, he's decked out with. Is like it a, any good, though? It is good. I enjoyed it. I Because you know we've been tossing around ideas yeah. to do our own we just have to do them we do have to do them um so he's decked out in like scarf glasses random hat he says uh to get like a giant camera with a lens hood to look like a professional camera it's it's you got to just watch it to to make it funny um some of the poses though include the the mr bean look the blue steel look the spider-man and a bunch of uh, other tips that he gives just really good stuff you can check that out on the website 
Um, another fun story, a Brazilian stock photo agency called Diomedia created a new ad campaign that showcases animals taking selfies. Uh, the I ad saw was, that. That was actually cool. It was cool, yeah. The ad was used to debut a new National Geographic collection, and they wanted to share the news in a way that would uh, relate to today's audience. Uh, so it shows like a bear taking a bathroom selfie, a koala bear taking like a selfie against an elevator mirror. Uh, my favorite, my favorite is the the gopher. He's like holding up the phone that's like as tall as him and like taking a picture in the bathroom a selfie. It's in the hole. <laughs> Do you know what that's from? Uh, no. In the hole. It's in the hole. It's a beautiful day. I'm gonna go get some gopher, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna step up to the tee at the ninth green. I'm gonna take a swing, and uh, it's in the hole. What is that from? Caddyshack. I don't Bill remember. Bill Murray. That. I haven't watched Caddyshack since I was like twelve. Bill Murray. Yeah. Good. Good man. Um, now the caption on the image reads in quotes: "There are there are lots of terrible animal pictures out there. National Geographic collection, uh, the best of nature." National Geographic collection, the best of nature images are here, end quote, which I thought was pretty clever and a, a good way them. to showcase I, this ad. Definitely worked. Something different for once, you know? Yep. Uh, Nikon released another video from their behind the scenes series. Um, uh, Tamara Lackey, right? Did I get that right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's Tamara. Another one featuring her. Uh, this time around, she shows how to did capture. She, did she actually look through the camera to take a picture she this time? She did look through the camera right, this just time. Just checking. She shows how to capture an authentic smile. Really quick video. It's just explaining the difference between, you know, like a, a, a fake smile and a real laugh and smile kind of thing. Uh-huh. Um, it's, it's good tips, you know. Right? <laughs> uh, and then moving forward, we have a couple more stories. This is scary stuff. A drone and an airliner almost collided midair in Florida recently. According to uh, FAA Administrator Jim Williams, this past March, a drone nearly hit a U.S. Airways jet coming close enough to concern the pilot about potential jet damage to the plane. Uh, the drone was said to be violating rules by flying at an altitude of 2,300 feet when the legal limit is 400 feet. We have a, there's a legal limit? Apparently. See, I didn't know this. See, what's going on right now, everybody wants a drone and I'm worried about flying them personally. Yeah. Because you, um, um, could you imagine if the drone flew into the jet engine? No. And I mean, it's caused it's an engine to blow up disaster. and the, pl- and the plane to crash. Yeah. You have to think about this stuff. There has to be, there, this is on both sides. It's on the photographer side now and it's on the FAA side. There needs to be education. They need to come up quickly with rules for flying drones. Uh, um, they, they have to do it. They really ju- they just have to get on the ball with it. I agree. Um, and now t- talking about rules, the FAA has planned to put into effect uh, rules for commercial drones this coming November. But according to Engadget, uh, it could be years till the rules are actually implemented, which they should be implemented right away because right now that's the, that's the new craze. Uh, drones everywhere. Uh, and speaking of drones, a company called Parrot announced a new drone. It's called the Bebop. A 14 mil- megapixel sensor it has, fisheye lens. It's ooh, ooh, Wi-Fi ooh, enabled. Ooh, 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 What's up? What's it called? The Bebop. B-E-B-O-P. That reminds me of a song. You know what that song? Mbop? Yeah, Mbop. <laughs> they had the hottest lead singer. That girl, she was so hot. It's like the, Heim, three girls, right? Yeah, the first time, the first time I saw that video for Mbop, I'm like, who that is girl. that sexy I'm like, that lady? That sexy girl, that lead singer, she is so hot. And then <laughs> I re- how she get her hair so and straight? Then, and then they were like, "That's a guy." I'm like, "Oh, <laughs> well, he made looking, he made for a good looking girl." You know, it's funny, Taylor is, Hansen. Uh, apparently, they have um, a new. They paired up with some beer company, and they're releasing beer called Um Hops. Uh, um Hops. You how does, it? You how does the it? song um, go? <laughs> it's, we just sang it. That's. But you yeah, did a terrible butchered version of it. I did the slow down, like where in the world? I, I never is, knew what they were saying. It's like that. Um, bop, shabu, bop, ba, do, it's like that. Scooby da, ba, do, bop. What's that one song? Like I'm blue, oh. da, ba, de, ba, da, da. It's like that song. You never really know what they're saying. Oh, can you reset that? I did. All right. Um, they. I forget. It's like you're going in a new bop. You're gone in a new bop. You don't <laughs> care. Yeah, in a new bop. You're gone in a new bop. You just don't care. Oh, yeah. And they started another band too. Uh, They're very popular. Years later, still. I forgot what it was called. It started with some with a P, but P bop ba do bop ba do bop ba shoo ba do. 
So anyway, this new drone, it has a 14 megapixel sensor, fisheye lens, Wi-Fi enabled, both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, kind of your standard these days. Uh, they have a pretty cool remote control, though, which is called the Sky Controller, which is also Oculus Rift enabled. Uh, it can extend the range of the drone to about uh, 1.2 miles or two kilometers. Uh, downfall is that the flight time is limited to only 12 minutes, kind of like the first DJI. Yeah. Uh, did no, you? Did you? No pricing yet, though, or availability uh, listed. So we'll Somebody see. Somebody had when this an thing octocopter. Optocopter in Israel that was flying a Canon Rebel. Because you need them for the actual DSLRs, well, correct? Yeah, for the but weight. they had goggles for it, and I wore the goggles while they flew the thing. So did it look like you're like a bird? It, did it feel like that? No, it didn't feel like that. It just felt like I'm looking through a camera that's looking at me oh. flying. Was it cool? I guess. How much does something like that cost? I don't know. They didn't fly it for too long because we were on a roof. Are those kind of things like hand built or do, do they actually sell rigs? They sell. Well, I know the Jiji make some as well. <laughs> and they're probably crazy expensive, yeah, right? Yeah, probably. And the, the drone wars are heating up. Yeah. Oh, wait a second. That's a Star Wars <laughs> movie title, isn't it? The Drone Wars, wasn't well, that? No, I think it's... Um, drone Wars Episode 2? Did they actually name the movie that? Or wasn't it the video game or TV series named that? Uh, something was Drone Wars. Yeah, something was dr Drone Wars. I think it, it was like the animated TV series they put out after. Uh, and then we have one last story. Uh, an F-Stoppers reader bought a Flash unit from an online store that wasn't named, uh, in which the store advertised it as the best affordable compact Flash. Well, apparently the reader needed to repair the Flash, and it had like um, this sticker on it of some sort. Uh, so he took the sticker off, revealing the actual name of the original manufacturer, which was the Young no Young Now, Young, Young Now, Now, whatever it's called, Young New, Young New. Um, so it ended up being that Flash, which only retails for about fifty dollars these days, and the photographer paid more than double that, around one hundred and thirty dollars for the Flash. Um, which again, that company said was the best affordable compact flash, yeah. which I think was the YN460. Um, ridiculous that, uh, that companies are doing that these well, days. Well, I didn't hear what happened fully. We were in Israel. We were talking about this on the bus because one of the guys who was with us works at F-Stoppers was asking if we heard about it. And he was talking about the photographer guy that did this. And he didn't even come out and I think take, take ownership for it, saying that that he did do this but the basically the photographer said that yeah no no the guy on the bus was he, we don't know who the i know i think he said who the photographer was but i don't recall the name they did say the name on oh, the they website did? yeah but it's like you have this product why would you put your own sticker on top of another sticker why wouldn't you remove the other sticker it, it, there's it's okay to have third party stuff done it's like it's like me having a black rapid that doesn't have black rapid on it and trying to pass it off as a black rapid yeah but I'm in conjunction with Black Rapid. I mean, he might as well said, look, I have a young new flash. They've helped me. I've developed and tweaked some things to make it my own. Yeah. Well, I think the young now or young new flash, uh, I think it was actually like etched into the plastic, right. kind of like Canon and Nikon would have. I and they just the put a sticker on. I don't know why you would think that it was normal to have a sticker on there like that. I don't know. I, I want to. I, I hope there's follow up on it, but I thought it was interesting to talk about. Yeah, I basically don't buy anything from anywhere else besides either Allen's or B&H because... I don't trust stuff like that. Right. Especially when it's, if it's too good to be true kind of thing, price wise, it is too good to be true. Got it. Uh, and that is it for photo news this week. Lots of stories. Okay. We're kind of finally caught up. And right. I obviously didn't get to cover everything from the past week that we missed, but I tried to cover more of the bigger stuff. Yeah. And then you can go to fronosphoto.com slash raw talk hyphen 86 for all of the news stories and more. So you're up. It's your turn to do this now. Yes, sir. Now that I'll be talking. So, Obviously, I was in Israel, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people want to know why or what I was doing, and I'm just going to share as much as I can about why I was there and, and, and have a discussion with you about it, because it was literally the best trip I ever had. And part of the, being the best trip was because of the people I was with, the places we went, and just how well it went. It was great. Why was I there? There's an, the, there's an organization, nonprofit inside of Israel called Kinetis, and their job is to spread the word about Israel. Not spread the word, but for Jews. It's not a Jewish thing. And that's something that we're going to talk about moving on, is that it's, Israel isn't just Jews. And I guess I'll talk about it's it right now. It's a stereotype these days. It is a stereotype. But what, what you have to realize is that, yes, it's the, the Jewish homeland that was founded in 1948 or given to them in 1948 by the UN. And a very interesting thing that I learned when there was that the French and the British were in control of that land before the UN and they decided to give it to Israel. And... This land was not the first choice for Israel. There was places in Africa that they thought about giving to Israel to be their homeland, but it ended up being here. And, and what people don't understand is that Israel, there's Muslims living there, there's Christians living there, there's Jews living there. 
all in Jerusalem, you've got the you've got the Jewish quarter, you have the Muslim quarter, and you have the uh, or sorry the Arab quarter, and you have the the Christian quarter. All of these major religious things are there. The Jews have the Wailing Wall. The Muslims have the Temple Mount, which we're not allowed in, by the way. Jewish people, you mean? Mus- uh, Non-Muslims. Oh. You're not allowed in, just like the Muslims aren't allowed into the Wailing Wall. Interesting. They have a they have a guard set up. We went, we walked towards the area where the, it's at. You're allowed to walk up to these steps. But say, how, how do they know if you're Muslim or not? Well, they look at you. Yeah. They pretty much can... can profile you and tell you okay they have a security guard there it's an israeli it's an israeli military personnel who is muslim right so there are those guys in the army but that and then you have the holy sepulcher which is where we went which is where jesus had was supposedly uh nailed to the cross yeah and where he was possibly buried that's a huge christian thing but anyway back to why i was there um this organization called kinetis is there to help spread the word and bring people in, regardless of being Jewish or not being Jewish, about Israel being more than what pe- most people think about it. And I'll ask you in a minute what you, the first thing that comes to mind, because there's one thing that comes to mind when you talk about Israel. And basically, it was a free trip. It was a free trip that I helped them get the right photographers for. They've done food bloggers. They've done wine tours where they bring in the, the bloggers. They offer them a free trip. And their hope is that they write about their experience and cool. what they think about it. And it's, it's, it, you could call it propaganda, but you could also call it awareness. And yes, it's a free trip. We traveled in luxury. We did everything very well. It was, it was great. Um, so, so it's, it's not like you are needed to write about it, but we don't have to write about anything. They hope they that hope, you will write they about hope, it but they're, in they're a positive hoping, manner, of course. Well, in whatever manner you want. Yeah, of but course that's they want, their hopes. Yes, their hope is that you you showcase what Israel has to offer. Is really like. Right, what it is really like. And, get, and you get that, and it's a trip. But that's because we have a following, and we can reach people. So I helped them find the right photographers. We had uh, Adam Lerner went, mm-hmm. Benjamin Von Wong, cool. uh, Simon Pollock, who a lot of people know Think Tank, and, and uh, what's that? Peak Clip and Three-Legged Things, he does social media for those guys. So he also works, does stuff for Digital Photo School. So he has a very nice reach, access to it. Uh, Rebecca Litchfield, she's a, a, a London photographer who does more setup stuff with models and things like that. And then we had Mike Kelly, who works with F-Stoppers, but also did that airplane photo that, that went across uh, that just blew the up. internet yeah. so far. He's the one who did that shot. So he was there. Um, so what is the first thing that comes to mind when somebody says Israel? War, I would say. And Definitely that's, war. And that's what 9 out of 10 people say that have never, ever been there. Just because that's all I was ever introduced to. Like media coverage, everything else is always talking about war when it comes to that. Right. But when you're there, it is beyond safe. Oh, I'm sure. It's safe. They, yes, they built this wall to separate the Israelis from the West Bank. But as soon as they built the wall, all the bombings that were going on stopped. There was major bombings going on every week. Blow and Ziv Karan was Karan was there shooting some of these things. The aftermath of some of the bombs. I showed you the pictures in the book. Yeah, they with just the bodies laying there. Hard to, to look clothes at. Clothes blown off. Yeah. So the Israeli see what people. Uh, well, it's like it's like what did you tell me when you came back to Philly the first night you walked down the I, street? I walked to go get sushi. And I felt less safe walking around the streets of Philadelphia than I did walking down tel- in, in the st- on the streets of Tel Aviv. Yeah. I mean, you walk a couple blocks down the street and you're not in a great area. I did not feel safe here. Yeah. And I felt completely safe in Israel. And that's not propagandist BS. People have a misconception. Israel, they think it's all war. Yes, they are a military state. It's a democracy. The only democracy in the Middle East. Uh, but you got to remember, you're we're surrounded in the U.S. We have Canada to the north; they're not going to invade us. And we've got Mexico to the south; they're not going to invade us. Israel has the whole Middle East that wants to wipe them off the face of the earth. Yeah, they're right, right in the middle of it. So they have to protect themselves by any means necessary to further their life. But what, the, what, what I gathered not get I, this is my second time in Israel. But what what happened is. There's history there. You go to Jerusalem. You walk around the streets. You talk to Palestinians. You talk to these people, the Muslims, the Arabs, who want to have a conversation. You just have these conversations. I felt safe walking through these quarters. They took us through the Jewish quarter, the Muslim Arab quarter, and and this is all in Jaffa Gate. This is in Jerusalem. I don't know if it was Jaffa Gate. Was it Jaffa Gate? I don't know if it was Jaffa Gate, but 
it they took us to where tourists don't normally go mm-hmm. when these there's these mar- these markets they had burka like stores more local stuff right. kind of thing they had burka stores they had toy stores they had just everyday life things with people walking around conducting their everyday business food restaurants um and and then we went towards the temple mount which is the big gold dome yeah. in israel and it's all arab stores through there so i would ask if i could take a picture so i went up to this one guy and it's like you know picture and they're like yeah yeah do they english speak? yes okay. they do have most people all israelis sure speak if, english most I, of the people speak i saw english. like the signs some of the signs you posted on instagram and most of them are in english well yeah if not all well it's a it's a world you know, obviously a lot of people speak english it's the way that we can communicate because i don't know hebrew uh and or arabic but so there was this younger guy with his dad and his brother running their little store and they set up for this picture and i took the picture and he goes facebook <laughs> he goes facebook <laughs> yeah facebook and i'm like okay he, he's like what's your facebook i'm like all right he hands me his phone it's in arabic i'm like can you make it english he's like yeah typed in my thing he sent me a note And I'm like, I'm going to send you this photo. That's cool. The language of Facebook. Yeah. The fact that Facebook, whether you're... Is worldwide. The reach that you can communicate with somebody that I never thought I would ever communicate with. And this is in the Muslim quarter. We had a great... We didn't didn't, didn't speak English very well, this guy, but we communicated. We connected with something. We talked. We took photos and they were happy to do it. Was he older or younger? He was younger. His dad was older, but he sat there did too. Did he also have a Facebook? His dad. That, that's didn't what have. I wonder if uh, the older generation from no, his worldwide dad did, has. But every a kid has a cell phone. Yeah. Everybody. Then we went further into the Muslim quarter, walking around, and there was this group of four guys, and they were funny as hell, and they're like, "Take our picture, take our picture." They I saw asked the, me. Yeah. That, you saw. I showed them to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know when they'll be up when I'm still editing, but man, they were they were they were great. We're just people. If you can get past all of the other BS. Just to realize that people are people and get past the war and get the hatred stuff, you realize that in there, everybody pretty much gets along. Well, we're all human, yeah. And if there's we're ever... Only oh, human. God. <laughs> I bleed the same as you. Go ahead. And there's ever a, a language barrier, just show them Facebook. <laughs> well, here, here's another good thing. To go. So you have the history in Israel. Yeah. The, the, one of the points that we talked about when, when we were with the, the Vibe Israel, the Kinetis people that were bringing us there, we talked. their thing was... You know, Israel is more than war. Israel is technology. There's Google there. Wix has their home office there. Wix is that free website place, which we went to their offices. You've got 70% recycling when it comes to water. Wow. They're, because they're in the middle. Of the, they have to survive. So they have great energy consumption uh, savings. They have just the technology that's created there is tremendous. But beyond that, you have the history, but you have the future. When we went from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv... It was unbelievable. Tel Aviv is a beachside town. Mm -hmm. The beach is gorgeous. They have hotels. You know, there's a Hilton there. There's a Renaissance. There's all these different hotels there. The food is tremendous. So people think that it's the Middle Ages. It's not. It's It's a beautiful, it's a modern functioning city. It is so, or country too. And uh, Tel Aviv, I could see living there. There's bars. There's restaurants. The people are amazing. It's more Um, like a city, I guess. Well, it's it's a big city. Yeah. Huge city. Beach city. Uh, my Just, my geography is terrible. I don't know much. I, well, see and, around and that area. Here, here's another thing. Mike, the guy that we were with, Mike Kelly, went to Catholic school growing up, mm-hmm. and he his parents were worried about him coming to Israel. They were like, "Keep your head down. Are you safe? Are you wearing a Wear flak your jacket? Vest, yeah. Are you wearing a helmet?" And he's like, he's like, I had no idea that this was such an amazing place. He's like, I, this was not even on my radar as a place to go. And maybe even vacation at, you know, well, I'd go vacation there. Yeah. I mean, if it wasn't a 12 hour flight, but That's he's like, flight. I never expected it to be so amazing, so beautiful to be so safe. He's like, and my parents are calling me every day asking, is everything OK? Because all you thought, think about Israel is war and it just isn't. My brother's in uh, Qatar, I think. And Qatar, Qatar, whatever it's however it's pronounced. Qatar. Okay, well, there, and it's same thing. He, he's in the city part for the Air Force right now. He's stationed there for the next few months, and he's showing us, like, video every now and then through Facebook, which, again, like, how many miles away, uh, and it's just beautiful. All these, everything he's showing us pictures of, he's showing us pictures from the plane when he's flying over yeah. and stuff. Well, speaking of the plane, it's a 12-hour flight. Wow. It was a 12-hour flight direct from uh, 
P- Philadelphia, a PHL, I almost said. At least it was direct. I, yeah, direct on US Air, which was tremendous. It was great. I really enjoyed the flight. I mean, didn't enjoy 12 hours on the flight. It was 12 hours home. Yeah. It's like 11 hours there. It's my flight to Hawaii was the same thing, but we had a layover too. Right, and this was direct. Adam flew direct on El Al from Philadelphia. Um, oh, sorry, from, from New York. Mm-hmm. And so on the plane... They had first-run movies and stuff. Nice. All the movies that I bought for my iPad or rented, downloaded, were running there. So I'll just read what I bought. I, I watched. I watched um, a bunch of movies. I watched Nebraska, which is I that black and white movie. That was good. It was pretty good. wasn't bad. I watched Dallas Buyers Club. Unbelievable. Jared Leto won an Oscar for that. Fantastic. And so did... Um, and Matthew, and McConaughey. Matthew McConaughey. It was that good of a movie. Unbelievable. He lost movie. like sixty pounds for Holy that movie. Yes. And Jared Leto too. Unbelievable yeah. movie. I got. His, I did. I didn't know that's what it was about. It's still on my list that I want to. Fantastic. Watch. Uh, Inside Liam Davis or whatever. It was a oh, indie movie. Uh, it's not Liam Davis. Uh, Lewin. Lewin. Lewin Davis. Yeah. I didn't like it. Yeah. That, I was hoping uh, to like it. Mumford and Sons and stuff did a bunch of, uh, and Justin Timberlake, I think, did music for that. For the well, soundtrack. Justin Timberlake's in the movie. Oh, is he? Okay, yeah. Well, that's I loved why. it. I, I, I saw the coming attractions for that movie, and I thought it was something that I really, really wanted to see. And go ahead, do that, because I got something that I'm going to okay. ask you. And and it just it, it wasn't that good of a movie. I know this isn't movie talk, but my question is, would you guys like me to do start up Frono's movies again? What are you looking at? Just You're just double checking everything? Yeah, Frono's movies I did a while back. I'm going to change it up. I'm thinking of doing it with Todd Wolf, but changing it and making it different. So if you would be interested in, in that being separate, it would be separate from Frono's photo because that's how it has to be. Hashtag yes, Frono's movies. I'd love to hear what you guys have to think. But then the last movie I actually bought, I spent $14.99 because I couldn't rent it. It was a pre-buy. It was her. Yes, I wanted to see that for a while. The Spike Jones one. Spike Jones. And I sat there on the plane, and it actually, it wasn't there on the way, but on the way coming home, it was actually available. Oh, they, same plane? Well, or same service? Same, it was still US Air. Wow. So it actually was now available, but I watched it on my iPad. Talk about a unique, original screenplay. Unbelievable. It was... I thought it was a remake from an 80s movie. I don't think it is. I think it's an original screenplay. I could have sworn... It was, I don't know, maybe I'm getting it mixed up with something else. If, if it is, let me know, but I thought it was original because I haven't seen anything like it. Mm-hmm. It takes place in the not too Or it was inspired by another movie maybe. from the 80s I don't something. know, but it was basically just, just a quick side because I enjoyed watching this. This helped me on the airplane ride was watching these movies, and it was just an unbelievable story. The future, I love future, not too distant future because it wasn't, I'd say, maybe 20 years down the road, and just what's going on, the technology that was there and the future thinking... You don't see a lot of sci-fi stuff that is, could be realistic anymore. And that was, it was really an interesting movie. I loved it. Who's the, the girl behind the actual Scarlett hurt? Johansson. Oh, yeah. Scarlett Johansson. All right. So back to Israel. Hello, hello. Back to more things about it. Um, the misconception is that everybody there is ultra-Orthodox Jew. You know, with the Pachs and they pray nonstop. And that is not the case. I would say that 90% of the people, Jews living in Israel, they're Jewish, but they're non-practicing, non-believing. Do you think that's, because I feel like that's also around, you know, the U.S. these days. A lot of just religions in general are just kind of slowly going downhill. I wonder if that's just a universal thing from around the world just because of today's technologies and beliefs and I don't. I don't know. I don't know. But the but the observation is that not everybody's religious. Not I, everybody I observes there. I definitely would assume that everyone is observed there. Yeah. So I talked about the language of Facebook. I just honestly, guys, I'm looking at a bunch of notes because I didn't want to forget some things. And in Israel too, if you're an Israeli citizen, you have to go in the army. Hmm. When you so it's when like you, a draft kind of. No, it's not a draft. It's mandatory. Or yeah. That's when you I mean. when you get out of high school, men go for three years, women go for a year and a half. It's mandatory. But what, but what I realized about that is that it doesn't matter if you're rich. It doesn't matter if you're poor. They are one as a nation. They realize that they're there. To, they have a small army, but effective. Very highly trained. Very skilled. Uh, they're, they're, it's, a, it's very you know, well, well it's, put together. It's like I saw the photos in Ziv's book. And uh, yeah, they, all, they look very well trained and, and like you said, well put together. So, so the men go, the women go. But the camaraderie that I noticed in Israel was unbelievable because Everybody's there for the betterment and the future of their nation. It's only 66 years old. I had landed the day of their independence. Uh, our July 4th here in the U.S. was there. In, they have their Independence Day, which was there May 5th, I believe. Okay. Um, 
and they were celebrating the 66th birthday. They have their president, Shimon Perez. You're, you're talking about somebody that was there before the nation was born. It's like having Thomas Jefferson still alive today or, or Ben Franklin yeah. or George Washington. One of the founding fathers. Or John Adams. They have that still. They're that young, but they've prospered in the desert when they were given nothing. They had well, they're nothing. they're just that young when it comes to being independent. Being independent, yeah. but before that, but, but as a nation, it's like you've got Israel, and then you've got all of these other places around that wish they had the technology and everything that they had there. Uh, and I'm not sitting here trying to sell you on the fact. I'm just trying to let people, make people aware. Educate. Of, of, of what's there. Yeah. And I, I would go vacation there. I literally thought Tel Aviv was very similar to Fishtown. Because there's art, wow. there's museums, there's music, there's unbelievable food. We ate like freaking kings, not not like kings, but we went to we went to we went to Arab restaurants, we went to Italian restaurants, we went to just native Israeli restaurants. It didn't matter. The food there was incredible. We had so much. Did they have a, a Philly cheesesteak? No cheesesteaks. Because <laughs> no che- everywhere you go these days, there's some kind of knockoff Philly. I didn't cheese hear steak. about a cheesesteak there, but it's interesting but, to see if. Israel would have five one. star. Well, not, they have they have seven star hotels there. Some of them seven. Yes, star. over the top. Like this one. Was How do you just, even rank yourself as seven? Because stars? they're just so over the top. <laughs> we we didn't stay at that. We 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 stayed at this place called the Diaghilev. What it was, was like a rock and roll hotel. Basically, was that, was that like four stars? It was very nice. It was like a, it's where I interviewed Von Wong. Yeah. Um, for one of the future podcasts, uh, I had it's like a mini. It was like a mini apartment. It was bigger than most New Yorkers' apartments. Doesn't it only become a like a, a, a rated restaurant when like a reviewer just comes and stays one time and eats there? And, and I have no re- idea. Reviews it as like a four star. I don't know how. I that thought is. it was only like if one person says it's a five star. I doubt or something. it. I think it's. Is I, there a different system like that? There's probably I don't really a system know, that people have to go through to get rated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hotel was awesome. Oh, and then we had a tour manager named Adi. Adi. And Adam used to go, what's after AC? <laughs> because I, I would call her Addy. And he's like, it's not Addy. What's after C? Uh, what's after A, you know, A and yeah, yeah, C? Yeah, yeah. It's like, Addy. I'm like, oh, okay. She, I she, probably would have pronounced her name Addy. <laughs> she, she was in the army a while back, and she was, she was a higher up. She moved up. She's about our age, I think, um, my age. And she lived in the U.S. for, I believe, 10 years. She's back in Israel now with her husband and two kids. And she was the tour manager. She was the one that made sure everything was where it needed to be and that we were all... I felt... Adam said this to me. Adam said, I've never seen you so relaxed or calm for a week on ever. Yeah, you, you texted me the one night when he said that. But it, it was like, I didn't have to worry about things. I still did my work for the website. I still, you were back here doing other work, editing. You, you know, you had a task to do and you did yeah, it. Yeah, I put up the raw talks. Yeah, and you, you put out a Facebook uh, post. Yeah, and first time I did that for you was for me. filling all the information and, and put everything in. Usually you do all the back end stuff when it comes to I'm that. I'm trying to give some responsibility away. It's fine with me. So that it makes my life easier, like being in Israel, to focus on what I needed to do focus on yeah. while Adi made sure that we had all our travel arrangements. We had VIP service at the airport. We had a VIP girl. Her name was Jenna. Jenna. <laughs> <laughs> she Did she was, have a friend named Forrest? No, she didn't. But they, she had a sign that said Jared Poland. Oh, yeah? And I'm like, that's me. And she's like, all right, come with me. And I had the letters for pre, you know, to help me get through security quicker. She skips all the lines, goes off to the side. The VIP people take you through much easier. So cool. And, and then coming home, we had the VIP as well. Now, let me explain to you how it works getting to the Ben Gurion airport. There's a checkpoint, military checkpoint that you have to go through before you get anywhere close to the airport. Hmm. They, they asked the guy, the, the taxi guy who's driving, who's in your car. They opened my door to ask me some questions. Adam was next to me, but I answered all the questions. Because once they realize that you're an American and you know, they're making, they're, they, they profile. They have no qualms about profiling. Here, profiling becomes against the Constitution. They are protecting their way of life. Anyway, they open the door, you ask some questions, then you go in. When we got to the, the terminal, I had a VIP guy, Adam had a VIP guy. They help you get through security. You skip the hour-long line. I'm sure it costs some money, mm-hmm. which I would definitely pay for if I went to skip the line and to get through security much easier. But you get up to the security where you leave your shoes on, you leave your belt on, you leave your jacket on. Oh, wow. You only take out your laptop. You walk through a metal detector. You don't go through a freaking radar machine that checks your body to look at your balls. Yeah, did you right? get patted down again? No, they didn't do that. Hmm. It's Israelis, man. Yeah. They are just... They don't fake 
security like the tsa fakes the sense of uh being secure yeah. and forcing you to do all this stuff and go through all these the israelis have so many different checks and they know what they're looking for they're just they're they're, they're fighting for their survival usually that's why they're protecting everything anyway i hope i'm not is this interesting to you yeah hearing this stuff did, did they check your fro for like hidden weapons they didn't check my fro <laughs> no squirrels no cats food <laughs> the tour manager yeah back to adi fantastic lady she's coming back here with her with her family i offered they can stay here like in philadelphia they're coming to philly oh, they want to cool. go to they want to go back to sesame place they used to live in jersey where do they live in jersey in central jersey i live in jersey her for husband that don't know her husband uh travels back once a month because he, he's, he has a business that he runs part-time through here hmm. but he lives in israel so he's taking that trip to new york all the time um she was great having everything taken care of i mean we got stuck in uh en Gedi. En Gedi is where the Dead Sea is. It's literally an oasis. So En Gedi is an oasis. It's green. It's lush. There's flowers. There's everything. And then the desert, the Dead Sea. We had a photo shoot at the Dead Sea. It was supposed to start at 4.30 in the morning. We had 12 hours of torrential downpours, which wow. is unheard of in the desert. The models Why it's couldn't, a desert. <laughs> the models couldn't get in because the roads were not just flooded, because there's flash floods that happen because it never rains. Um, boulders across the road. But because Ayal, this one guy that was helping us, was everybody's former, former military, but he knows so many people, they got a military escort through. The Humvee made sure that they could make it through. That must be nice. Yeah, so they got through. We got stuck there. So the photo shoot didn't happen at 4.30 in the morning. It ended up happening around noon. And as soon as Adam and I got out there with the rest of the people, it started to rain again. And it was so windy. And you'll see that in my behind the scenes video. But it we had photo shoots there. Adam got some amazing stuff. Von Wong was doing great stuff. Re uh, Ray, uh, Rebecca Litchfield was doing stuff as well. I haven't seen it yet. But what's funny is you, you walk down this path and the guy's like telling us, he's like, okay, follow me down this line. Don't deviate because there are sinkholes. Wow. You don't want to fall into the sinkholes. Uh, and then if we go further, further to the left, there's a minefield. Oh, that's scary. Right. Well, there, there was a minefield from the wars. Yeah. The earlier wars. I'm but sure. We were away from that. Uh, Hopefully. But, yeah. But he, we, we led us down to the beach. It's not a beach that you would lay on. It's calcified salt. So it's, it's all the dead spiky. sea. Oh, but Adam got cut just touching it. Really? Yeah. I wore my um, my uh, my echo boots. And yours, didn't they get kind of jacked up? Uh, I the, the one leather ripped on one of the eyelets, which shouldn't happen. So I tweeted the the echo people uh -huh. and and was like, what what do I do here? I'm like, should I send them back to you? Is there something? It's supposed to be like indestructible. I spent two hundred and thirty dollars for a pair of boots. Oh, that's a lot that of money. They're supposed to last twenty years. Yeah. And to have an issue where the eyelet's going to pop totally out, which means the shoes aren't going to be able to be tied tight, isn't good. So I reached out to them. I sent them a picture. I added. I, I make sure I hit at Zappos because uh -huh. that's where I bought. Actually, I'm like I've had these for three to five months. I said three months, but it's been actually four months. And they're like, oh, that's no good. That's not, you know, they're like, that's no good. <laughs> well, that sucks. That sucks. Uh, <laughs> take it back to where you bought them. And so I'm like, wait, so you're telling me that I need to go back to at Zappos to make sure to, to take care of something? And then I guess that was there. I'm like, that's not a good answer. And I'm not trying to be a dick saying that I'm going to complain about everything. But somebody was like, what happens when something goes wrong? You take it back to the store you bought it at. I'm like, they're like, even cameras. I'm like, no, I send it back to Nikon directly because that's what you're supposed to you send it back to canon yeah and it's like you know joe mcnally said that he had his for 20, 20 years, years that's why i bought them they were perfect so anyway you have them for three to five months and they rip already so zappos saw the tweet jumped right on it asked me to dm them direct message them on twitter asked me to verify my information which i did and they were like we're gonna send you a new pair tomorrow so and no questions huh no question keep the old pair as a backup that's great. I mean, holy what if, crap! Customer service. Yeah. What if uh, you know you you did it yourself? Like you, I don't well, know. But that they they uh, they realize that, but they hope for the best in people, and like well, that's good. That I hope for the best too. I wouldn't do something like that. Yeah. I don't want to complain. I'm good at it. It's a Jewish thing. I'm good at <laughs> complaining, <laughs> and also Jews are very pushy and tough in Israel. They're very pushy. You, it's kind of like you. Well, you, and they ask <laughs> lots of questions. Yeah. And they interrupt. That's uh, you. To a T, yeah. But they ask questions and they debate things. Yeah. Um, That's you. <laughs> very, yes, but you have to push back. Why don't it, you live in Israel? <laughs> eh, I don't know. I thought about it. Um, you, you, the Israelis are very pushy. So if you don't push back, you, you won't get anything done. Yeah. So if they say something and they're pushing and they're being aggressive, you just be aggressive right back. Be like, aggressive. Be e aggressive. But that was just like, 
in the taxi. We took a taxi. The guy ran the meter. It was 35 shekels to get to, um, be, uh, to, get to where we, Adam and I were going. When we're going back, we get in the cab. We tell the guy where we're going. He's gonna be, he says, 55 shekels. I'm like, start the meter. He's like, it's going to be 55 shekels. I'm like, start the meter. Let's see. We'll pay the meter because I knew it was only going to be 35 shekels. And he's like, he's like 40. I'm like, he's, I mean, he's like 50. I'm like, nope. And I'm like, just start the meter. And he starts driving. He didn't start the meter. And then he's like 30. He's like, and then he's like 35. I'm like, okay. So then he never started the meter. But he was just trying to, he's like, you know, the time of day. I'm like, don't give me that. We yeah. came an hour ago. That's the same thing with cab drivers around right. here, man. So stop dream, trying to be pushy. Speaking of shekels, and I'll get back to, the, well, anyway, Zappos took care of it. Thank you. Unbelievable service, customer service. They saw the tweet. They took care of the situation. And I asked, do you want, will I send them back in the box? I wanted to send them back. They're like, just keep them. That's Speaking great. of shekels, wow. I got shekels right here. This is 10 shekels. That's worth $3.41. Because uh, it's 34 cents to the dollar. That's a dollar. That's one shekel. And then this is a half a shekel. For what purpose they have a half a shekel? Because <laughs> one shekel is 34 cents. What is this, a 15 cent shekel? So is like one shekel like a U.S. dollar kind of thing? Or how yeah, is that compared? No, one shekel is 34 cents. Okay. So basically, uh, uh, my Coke would be three, maybe four or five shekels. I did a, I did a shot. I did a shot of that's rare of 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 Patron. You were definitely drunk after that shot, weren't you? <laughs> well, let me tell you about their shot. It was four ounces. Four ounces. The guy poured the shot. Isn't like a normal shot like one, one ounce or two ounces here? It's like a quadruple he, shot. It's a quad shot. Yeah, he poured the shot and it was fifteen dollars. It was a fifteen dollars shot because well, it was like forty five dollars, forty five shekels. That that's actually not a bad price. No, it wasn't. But he poured this shot at the bar, and and I'm like, dude, I'm like, what are you? I'm like, that's a shot. And Adam's <laughs> laughing at me, and this other girl, Karen, was laughing at me, and 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 Simon, I I took the shot. Oh. I killed the shot. <laughs> And I, I didn't feel bad at all, but I was hungry. I wanted to go hung. I wanted to go get something to eat. I wanted I wanted Oreos or something chocolatey. <laughs> I was out of chocolate. I wanted something to eat. The alcohol kicked in. And you're like, I just want to eat anything right so now. So the guy's like, there's a, a place a, a, around the corner. So I leave the I leave the hotel and go around the corner. And there's these bats. There's bats flying. And he ate a bat. No, no, His big head? bats were flying. <laughs> and I'm like scared. I'm like, ah! and I ran past them. And then I went into. I was looking for dessert. And I went to this Italian restaurant. And somebody's like, fro. And you drunkenly look, stooped in. No, I looked hey, to the guys. left. I'm like, what's up? They're like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm traveling around Israel. I'm hammered. And I'm like, I'm <laughs> going to get chocolate. So I got chocolate and I then told everybody. But I got recognized on the street, which was pretty cool. That's funny. But they didn't believe me that there were bats. When I got back, they're like, you're just seeing things because you're drunk. And I'm like, no. And I'm like, Karen, come with me. And she's like, oh my God, there's bats. So they came in and then we all went outside and the, and the bats were just looping around, hitting each other in the air because their sonar <laughs> must have been messed up. Um, but anyway, well, oh God, I got more stuff to talk about. I'm sure you do. Spoke at Google. 200 people showed up. I watched 200 the 200 fro readers. There's a behind the scenes photo uh, Von Wong set up to do a big group shot. Oh, you did a behind the scenes video of that? I didn't or? do a behind the scenes oh, video. Thought, he was setting up the whole time. That. Yeah, was, I saw him in the back like doing the chicken dance or something. I didn't see. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> but You'll see in the video when you guys watch it. Right. So I talked about that. Um, Adam said I was the most relaxed, and I think part of that had to do with not being connected to the internet. Um, I had a 3G hotspot that they gave us to use to to tweet and to do whatever we did, and I I kept it off for except for when we were riding in the bus when there was downtime. I'm at lunch. I'm not checking my phone. I felt so relaxed. I felt so. I You're felt good. so relaxed. Right. And then I got home and I felt all tense again because I've got the Internet running. I've got nonstop my phone going off. And there I was just like observing the clouds up, up in the sky. You should be doing that. And I was and I felt great because everything was taken care of and it was just so enjoyable. Well, it's like you said, one of the, the best things about the trip was just having that that tour manager just kind of. You know, making sure everything was scheduled, everything was on time, good to go. You didn't have to worry about that kind of stuff. Exactly. Uh, it's actually, funny thing is, I'm almost, I got through all, all my notes here. Oh, yeah? Yeah, because the, the moral of the story here is I, I'm completely honest with you guys when it comes to anything. It was a free trip for all of the photographers that went on it. We did have a nice luxury, ho well, we didn't always have a nice luxury hotel. The funny thing in, in Getty, because it was pouring, I woke up to a leak in my in my room 
because it was leaking through the ceiling. And then my power went out and I didn't have any hot water in the shower the night before. Um, so really, that wasn't a big deal. But I didn't make a big deal out of it. it oh, oh, my God. I forgot to tell you. Um, we got to En Gedi. And you know, you know, I'm a picky eater, right? Extremely. So the tour manager finally realized that we went out to dinner one night. She's like, I'm doing all the ordering. So she did all the ordering and I'm just sitting there as all the appetizers come out. Uh, chicken liver, uh, this type of food, that type of... Um, and I'm just sitting there going... Doo, 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 You're just doo, like, doo, doo, I doo, want doo. something with a lot of protein. I'm like, I don't want any of that. And she's like, what? And Adam's like, he's a very picky eater. He likes chicken. How do you have hamburgers without the bun? Well, they had hamburgers there. <laughs> they did. I didn't, I didn't want one. So I got schnitzel and french fries. Um, so she gave me a menu. I ordered. And then from that point on, she pre-called... Like, everywhere we went, she made sure they had the chicken... Or something. I mean, I ate salmon. I'm not. I'm not that freaking picky. She picked. She busted pretty, on my butt. You, you eat like the same thing every I do. day. And I like what I like, but I don't complain. Like I sat there, I didn't complain that. Oh, this sucks. I don't want to eat it. You know. Um, but uh, in Ingeti, she knew that there wasn't going to be anything for me to eat there. It was a straight up kosher restaurant, so it was all hummus and it wasn't really much. Well, that yeah. It was all vegetables. So she had me a, a grilled chicken brought in was delivered and was waiting for me so everybody was sitting to eat and I went and sat down and I took it out to start to eat and I got yelled at by a waitress she's like you can't eat that here that's meat this is a kosher table oh wow so she yelled at me I I'm like think... how am I supposed to know yeah I didn't realize it was a kosher little restaurant so I got I got upset I got upset <laughs> Oh, I got upset. I was told no. I don't like being told no anymore. But what did you start crying at the table? No, no, no. I picked it up. I'm like, okay, where? This where? is bullshit. No, I'm like, where can I eat? I'm like, because I saw the tiles on the ground that looked to me like a separation of the lobby to the, the restaurant. Kosher and the non-kosher. Basically, I'm like, is that table kosher? Is that table kosher? And she's like, that's not funny. This isn't funny. I'm like, but where can I eat? How about that table? She's like, no, that's kosher. I'm like, how about that one? Four feet away in the lobby. She's like. That one you can eat at. I'm like, whatever. So I sat there and I ate and then I went back in when I was done. But and then, I, then I was relaxed. Yourself. Oh, and she and they were busting my balls, making fun of me. And then they would say some things. He said something about like Simon said something about kosher. And the girl cast the evil eye on me. Oh. The evil eye. She ate it. She's me. like, I heard you. She's like, I heard you. She's like, not your food. Not funny. Well, I didn't eat her food. <laughs> anyway, um, that's a lot of talking. I, I, so the moral of the story, I hope you guys enjoy this. Conf oh, actually, I talked about the shekels. I got three stones here from the beach, and I've got a seashell. My mom loved the beach, so I'll go put that on the, the gravestone. Jews don't. We don't really put flowers on gravestones. We put rocks because they last longer. I was going to say, it makes sense. So I brought back some rocks from the beach uh, in, in Tel Aviv, and nice. I'll take those over. and I'll Because she never got to go to Israel, unfortunately, and I've been there twice. Uh, she would have loved it. She would have loved it. She would have absolutely loved Israel. So the moral of the story here, and thank you guys for listening to this. This is what I'm doing. It was a free trip. It, it opened my eyes to many things, and it opened the eyes of other people who have, have never been there before. Von Wong was fun to hang out with. We all had egos, by the way, but that went out the window after the first day. Everybody got along when we realized... It was all good. I mean, I, I know Adam and you, obviously. Von Wong seems like a, a he's fun very, guy. Well, he's very similar out there like me so we have these egos where you clash a little bit but then everything was cool uh mike was cool rebecca was funny as hell from london she's just like jared <laughs> i'm like rebecca <gasps> she had me wear a tutu that i danced with um and stuff like that and then uh, simon is just awesome simon's from australia yeah. so so all in all the whole point of them giving us the free trips is to help people understand that Israel is more than just war, and it absolutely is. I felt safer there walking down the street than I did here. Tel Aviv is a modern freaking town of tech, music, food, art, and a beautiful beach. It's great. And, and the history is unbelievable. So whether you're Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, anything else, there is something in Israel history-wise for you, whether it's Jesus related, uh, Muhammad related, or or uh, anything relating to Judaism. It's all there. Yeah, I the, want to go there just for the, the history factor. You know, I'm a huge history buff. I love that stuff. Yeah. I tried to get you on the list. Yeah, I heard. Tried. Yeah. Tried to get you to be my video guy. It's all good. But next time. Anyway, I got Adam there yeah. because of the, f the photography stuff. So that's it, guys. It, it's just meant to make you aware of that and maybe one day put it on your radar as a place to go. That, that's that's. That's the Israeli part. Very so cool. let's do gear of the week. 
Oh, I forgot we have this stuff. Still we got gear of the week. We we'll, we still have the wheel of fro, and then we have an interview. Yes. This is how long oh, we're are we saving in? the interview for the end, I guess. Right? Is that yeah. What we're why? Doing? I don't know. We usually put it in between. Oh, we do. Mm -hmm. So you want to put the interview in now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry. I think that makes sense. All right. So. I we, one of the we went and we saw a lot of art. They took us to museums. They took us to a photographer by the name of Ziv Koren. He is a war photo well, he's a photojournalist who so happened to be embedded in a lot of uh, war areas in Israel Extreme and in Palestine in West Bank. He is a uh, Canon ambassador meaning he gets Canon gear from them. He helps decide what direction to take Canon cameras. He gives his input and feedback. He had the th one of the first 1DXs that he used when he went on a, on a trip. Wow. We went and we listened to him talk for an hour at his office. And I basically went up to him after and was like, can I come back tomorrow and do a raw talk with you? And Adam came with me and Adam did a portrait session with him, which was awesome. Nice. And, um, and the Adam, interview was great. Adam brought all his flashes and everything, right? His, he brought he travels light, but he still brought so flashes. So he just brought a couple umbrellas and an umbrella, stands, two umbrellas, strobes. Yep, stand. Good to go. A couple of flashes. He's shooting Canon, but he's nice. using Nikon flashes. Um, which oh, really? Are fine. Yeah, because it doesn't matter. It's just, just SB light. like nine hundreds. SB eight hundreds. Eight hundreds. Yeah, just triggering the light. Cool. So Ziv, I actually have his book right here. This is called uh, "More Than a Thousand More Than Thousand Words." Ziv Koren. This book, I couldn't find it on Amazon. He ended up just giving it as a gift. I didn't ask for it. He's like, here, take this. And he signed it personally. That's awesome. It's a, you saw this book. The, it, a lot of the stuff Very is in powerful. the early 2000s, after 9-11 type stuff. He has had access to Israel military. He's the guy that, that gets places that other people ha can't go. And he talks about that in the interview that he doesn't want to just stand in a line of photographers. He'd rather not even shoot if he can't get access. And I... And I, and I didn't sit there and be like, oh, I'm the same way. I let him talk. But I sat there and I was like thinking to myself, I'm glad somebody else feels this. That I'd rather not shoot a show from the pit. I'd rather not even shoot the show if all they're giving me is three songs from the pit. But yeah, you, you If want I can't something get something different. different. Yeah. So he talks about not cropping. There's just, this interview is cool. Remember, I'm resetting the camera each time after 15, 16 minutes um, because it was just me running it. That's where those Atomoses would have come in handy. But I, And remember, uh, there's not going to be the Rode microphones. Yeah. There's going to be the Sony We're using labs. the Sony lav packs for traveling. But this really opened my eyes. We'll talk about why it, what it opened my eyes to after this interview. So enjoy this interview with Ziv Koren. Ziv, thanks for having me here at your, uh, w would we call this your office? Yeah, office studio. It's called a studio, even though I don't shoot here. But it's kind of a, has a shape of a studio. Now, most of your stuff probably isn't done in the studio anyway. I don't shoot here at all. At I all. I mean, yeah, this is just my working space. So you, you obviously you're all location, photojournalistic uh, style stuff, which I love. Uh, we were here yesterday. For anybody out there, we we actually were here with a group, and we got to listen to Ziv speak, and it. It was fascinating. That's why I asked to come back the second day. But I love the fact that you have all of your contemporaries' work on the wall. I admire photography. It's my life. And, you know, I appreciate good photographers. Uh, so I think I'd rather have in my space uh, present other photographers than having my own work. I mean, I don't even, I cannot even think of having my pictures here. Sure. Um, there are some great photographers here that I admire and I think that they should be here on the wall. Absolutely. So going back to the origins of you starting with photography, because I, I know some of my readers may know you and some may not. Um, how did you get into it? I studied art in high school and just before I was supposed to begin my, my military service in the Israeli army, which is something that everybody does here, um, I had a motorcycle accident and I couldn't do anything really physical. And I applied to become a military photographer, and I was accepted. At the time, I thought it was a nice way to kind of go through the three years I need to serve uh, in the army. But while I was doing that, I really fell in love with photojournalism. And it was a short while before I, um, I was about to finish my service was the first Gulf War in, uh, in Iraq. And yeah. there were Scud missiles falling on Tel Aviv. And I find myself running, chasing the missiles, and there was a, um, it was a big thing here. Um, and then at that point, I think I understood that this is what I want to do in life. Um, and shortly after that, I, I 
was accepted to become a, a photographer in the government press office and a few months later I moved to the da biggest daily newspaper in Israel and then things just One happened. thing led to another. Yeah. That's the abridged version. I know I read it. I read some of it last night. Basically, when you were working with the Israeli government, you were in essence the president's photographer type of thing is what it said? The pres yeah, president and prime minister. So you were, you're the guy, you're there with everything, but that wasn't fulfilling enough because the images didn't see the light of day? Yeah, I think that, first of all, I was, I was uh, young and I wanted my pictures to be published in newspapers and magazines to see my credit and not just for the archive of the you know, government press office. And I wanted to do more. Sure. Um, and this is uh, the reason why I decided to do something else and, and you know, work on assignments and, and be out there, not just on the political side, but do other things. Uh, I think it was a smart decision at the time, uh, even though I left without knowing what's going to be my next step. I just thought I need something more challenging. Uh, that would be way. more fulfilling to what you were looking to do. Exactly. And, um, and that, that what happened. I mean, I started working with a daily newspaper and two years later I started you know, uh, I, I became uh, the Sigma representative in Israel. Sigma was really big at the time. Uh, it was a big thing uh, for me, and uh, I started working with uh, international magazines all over. And it was a period where, you know, things were happening in Israel. Actually, you know, Israel is a place to be a photojournalist. You know, there's, uh, there's more of a chance of something happening yeah, here. Ne never a dull moment uh, here. And there's always something to do and uh, things that happen and you need to react. and and be at the right time, at the right place, and, and just take it. So when the, when the scuds were falling, when it, when it comes to your photography and how you pretty much got into it, were you studying some of your, these great photographers' work beforehand, or did you discover that after you got into photography more? Um, I think it was a process that came along with uh, me falling in love with photography, and I'm totally self-taught. I mean, all my knowledge basically comes from books. I mean, it was way before the internet era, so sure. I'm, I'm obsessed with, uh, with buying books of photography. This is my biggest inspiration. So, yeah, I think going through books, um, especially in the era of um, World War II and especially war photography, that's, re that's something that really caught me. Um, so I was really looking for, for work of, um, by, by, photographer, by war photographers. Right. Um, um, Vietnam War. It's something that really, I think, uh, made a huge impression on, on me and um, this is the kind of direction I found that I'm being attracted to. Right. The, the books, obviously, your book collection is great and I started mine and I took pictures of yours so I see what I need to add to my bookshelf because that, it's the same thing. I get inspiration when I'm down or when I need to see something. I look at those books and you get lost, whether it's the 1900s or it's the World War II or, or whatever. It's just looking at the, the work of the people before us is, is, is great. It helps inspire me to get out there and do it again. Totally. It's, uh, it's the biggest inspiration for me. I mean, I find myself uh, taking some books out of the shelf and looking through them and seeing projects that photographers, or personal projects by amazing photographers that they've done. And what's really amazing about photography books, especially in, in this narrow thing that is in photojournalism or personal projects, it's uh, usually books that are being done, you know, in small capacities that we're talking about two or three thousand books, especially by, like, the, not many people would probably buy, uh, you know, bloody pictures um, uh, from uh, war zones and so on. And then, you know, they probably sell the first uh, stack in, in the next, in the first few months and then the books are out of print. Right. And, and ten years later you can't find them because nobody would want to reprint uh, these kind of books and they're really rare to find. So uh, I tried to put my hands on every book that in, in this subject uh, before they kind of disappear. get lost and disappear. Yeah. Um, so you do a lot of military type photos. You're, you're putting yourself into harm's way quite often. Has it been something that you've always done? You've been more okay with going into these extreme environments? Pretty much. I mean, in my 25 year career, I think that this is something that led the whole thing. I mean, uh, it started by covering the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It started even when I was a soldier, and then uh, I think even more in a more extreme way when I became an uh, um, independent uh, photojournalist. 
um, and it's something that I've been covering very intensively in the, throughout my, all my career. Yeah. So, so when you, you, you go into the army, they, they look for photographers, do they look for, for photographers? You mean as like when you go in because you have to do your service? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. It's an interesting way to do three years of service. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, there, there are a few. There's a um, IDF spokesman that have uh, some uh, uh, military photographers, and there's a, um, a magazine uh, in the military called the Machane, which is, you know, it's a, like a weekly supplement, sure. uh, and uh, so they have their own photographers. And I think because people are more aware of. of uh, the necessity of uh, using images, uh, even the ones that come out of the military. Uh, we find uh, more and more photographers serving in different units in the military hmm. for different purposes, but yes, they, they document more than they did in the past. Sure. So talk about the mentality that you have when it comes to the photojournalistic aspect. Um, the no cropping, your type of editing, just your style of getting out there and shooting. I work with a very strong ethical code. Uh, I think that uh, after we, we really hugged and kissed the, the whole digital era uh, for very good reasons, uh, obviously, uh, which, you know, the ability to transmit fast and, to, and it's faster and cheaper and, and all that. And, um, and the fact, which I think that this is the biggest privilege, the, and we spoke about that yesterday, um, the fact that we can use the, the ISO in a very um, extensive way that we could not do in the past. Uh, that's a big advantage for you know, photographers like me shooting in, you know, uh, in in a low, light, low light conditions and so on. Um, but the, the biggest problem that we are facing is that we are losing the credibility of photography in general and photojournalism in specific. Now in certain parts in photography, you can say that it makes sense. I mean, in, in fashion or in um, advertising, I mean, the, obviously a lot of Photoshop and retouching has been done, and that's quite legit, you know, from a, some perspectives. But if, if when that's kind of, these things kind of melt into photojournalism, we're facing a big problem, and that's we're losing the credibility of, photo, of uh, photojournalism. When people start putting Manip things where they should, manipulation. Manipulating pictures. No, it's, it's yeah, I mean, we've, we've heard a lot about that with the world photo uh, contest where people were doing exactly. that. Exactly, and, and this, we see that more and more. I mean, I think that uh, it's, a, it's, first of all, it's education, that uh, photographers in some occasions are not really aware of do's and not do's in, in the field of photojournalism. It, it would um, make sense not to, common sense for us would be, this is what you captured, this is how you present it. Exactly. Um, now, it's not just the photographer. It can be the photo editor. Right. It could be the graphic designer. It could be a regime. We've seen pictures come out from war zones that are being manipulated because the regime wanted to project a different image than what really happened on the field. So th it's not just the photographer. The, 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 the image goes through a few stages sure. and, um, that, that people should be more aware of. Um, the, the necessity of, of the credibility of photography. And you keep your credibility, you do it yourself. You do most of your, sh you shoot it, you edit it, and then you yeah, put out I'm, what I'm, you I'm, I'm, I'm self-sufficient, for me it's easier. I mean, I'm not part of a, uh, an agency, I mean, I am, but my, the kind of agency like Polaris Images, for example, is very different because we're all independent. I mean, I'm not, I work with my own cameras, and I, mean, I don't get a salary, I'm, we're kind of, there's this, different system that things work and um, yes I do my own edit and then I move my pictures to the agency so there can be no mistakes I mean it doesn't go to another hand before it reached the client or or I mean I think working with magazines is a bit different than uh, daily newspapers or websites that I've seen a lot of manipulating being done on, on and sometimes it could be you know people are you know, it's, it's, some mistakes can happen. Do you, do you crop at all after the fact? It's what you get in the camera is what you go with. Yeah, yeah. Which much, I, I mean. same thing. I, and I think that the, the most uh, strong ethical code I've seen is by AP, the American agency, AP, Associated Press. Uh, they even call in all the photographers to London to go through a course talking about do's and not do's in photojournalism. I mean, and even their work with, um, 
downgraded uh, version of Photoshop, which only allows you to use certain tools. Really? Uh, and I, I really appreciate that. Uh, I think it's the only agency that takes that so seriously that they won't allow uh, any of the photographers to do anything which is not out of their strict guidelines. Uh, National Geographic, for example, will not accept a story that is not shot in one take. You cannot edit your work at all. You should, it's all shot in RAW and you cannot erase even one single picture. Really? So if you've done a story for three months and you shot 200,000 images, you'll get a, you know, a CD, uh, like a hard drive with all the images. You cannot erase one single picture. This is the uh, insurance policy that tells you that this is exactly the way it was shot. That's, that's great. I mean, it's it, great it, that they're it, taking it, the initiative to do exactly, that. Exactly, but uh, they can afford themselves. And there are very few that can really uh, invest uh, the time, the money, uh, and you know, the deep thinking of uh, how to do it right and uh, how to uh, make your readers understand that you hold the highest level of uh, credibility in, in everything that has to do with photography. Absolutely. So how much do you think going back, you, you started with film, um, has that affected or how has that affected how you shot with digital? I think uh, because I'm considered old school, I think that I, I brought, you know, I'll, I'll give you a good example. Uh, you know, when I started photography, I was shooting with two cameras, one with chromes and one with black and white. Uh, and you never mix. And, and nowadays, I mean, I'm working on a black and white project uh, at the moment. And I called a few of my friends and colleagues asking them from, from an ethic perspective, is it okay to shoot a raw, digital raw file and turn it into black and white? Because even if you turn on the screen to black and white, it's, still the raw file is always in color. I yeah. mean, this is the basic file that, that the camera produces. And obviously they said yes. I mean, this is the new generation and this is how black and white is being done nowadays, even if you're shooting raw. So. Um, even that I needed to consult, I need to make sure that I'm doing the right thing because I, I don't mix up with that. I mean, I, I think that uh, photography is something that is so close to my heart and, and, and especially in, in photojournalism, you cannot allow yourself to lose the credibility of it. Sure. So I, I was, um, um, I, I like the flea market. I travel a lot in, in the flea market, you know, looking for old stuff. and. Uh, I found this box and it's a guy I know and he told me he bought it some years ago for a lot of money in, Par in, a, in a flea market in Paris. And it's handmade, it's, you know, it's one of a kind and it says Cartier-Bresson on it and um, I had to buy it. I mean, um, it's just I'm, I'm holding a piece that used to belong to Cartier-Bresson, which that's, is really... That, yeah, no, that's, that's <laughs> really unbelievable. Amazing. Was there anything in it? No, it was empty, uh, but it has like these squares to put the slides, you know, so it, it's, it has these divisions inside. So the, it's where the greatest images were. Probably, yeah, probably. Which, which is fascinating. So when it comes to personal work, you know, you were talking yesterday about how important it is to do personal work and you're not always doing assignments. Uh, what, what are some of the personal projects you've worked on and, and what you're working on now? There's always a personal project that runs along the, my daily work. I mean, uh, you, can, you need to kind of balance between uh, making a living and then doing something that is for the soul on one hand or, you know, uh, can tell a story, can make a difference, can do something which is not just, you know, making money. Uh, and they, I'm, I'm, there's nothing bad about making money. It's great. I mean, I wish photographers would even... Uh, we're we're uh, able to make um, uh, more money than they actually they, they do, but um, um, I can afford myself. I think that the camera is is a is a tool that uh, allows or gives me the ability to to touch people's hearts. Uh, I think that the uh, uh, picture, besides you know the the content and and um, you know. Um, the a philosopher that uh, I read a book uh, that she was talking a lot about uh, uh, photography and, and she said that the strength in, uh, in, in a good picture is that the eyes connected to the brain and straight to the nerve system and by viewing an, in, in a strong image you go through an emotional experience. Yeah. This is where I'm aiming in my photography. I want to 
people to feel. I mean, it doesn't have to be love, it doesn't have to be attraction. To feel something. To feel something. I mean, if somebody walks through a picture, you know, that I hang on the wall by me and they don't feel anything, I, I did something wrong. So when you're shooting, do you know those moments that have the feeling? Do they grab you? Yeah, some of them you know right away that this is it. You know, they know that this, is, this will make, you know, what I came here for. Um, and some you kind of need to edit and look back over them and, sure. and kind of, and, and I believe in, in storytelling. I mean, in a, in a story that is being done, not just single image. I mean, single image can be great, but I think that as a storyteller, you need more than one image to kind of tell the story. Especially nowadays that I think that um, photography is, um, um, we're lacking the fact uh, there's a disadvantage in the fact that there is no sound and motion in an image. So when you look at a TV, it's, everything is, first of all, it's very easy. It's, uh, it's all gotten kind of, uh, the, the job is being done for you. You don't need to really think much. Everything is being done for you. Looking at an image, you need to kind of invest it, you know, investigate the, the, the situation and to understand what was before and after. And you need a lot of more, I would say, uh, intelligence to get, uh, into the depth of, of what the picture really tells. It's storytelling, for me, is where it's at. It's, you have those images that pop. You have those ones that stand out. But when you can tell everything from, from start to finish, you've got the, the getting ready shots, you have the detail shots, you have the, story, the, the emotional stuff, that is what wraps everything together. Yeah, I think that this is, a, I will take it out this because it's kind of <laughs> vibrating on the sound. Ah, multiple, multiple <laughs> phones. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I totally agree with that, and I think that um, um, on the other hand, there is something much stronger in a still image than anything else. Um, because I have a theory, it's not, I mean, no doctor ever told that to me, but I, I have a theory that our memory is built from still images, not from motion. Because looking back at things, even in your childhood, you don't see the sequence, you see a kind of a still image. It's easier for us to, to digest and to remember one single frame than, you know, a sequence. If you, even if you talk to people that they think they saw something uh, uh, in the newspaper like 10 years ago and it was on TV, I mean, they don't even remember where they saw it because they remember the image. Uh, the image. They don't remember the sequence. Sure. So I think that a strong, and I think there's another reason for that. When you're watching TV, there's an editor who tells you how long will you see the image. Right. I mean, even if it's a still image, it will go through and then, you know, he moves on to something else. When you look at a strong image in a newspaper, a magazine, a book, no matter what, you can look at it as long as you like. It will be in your space. It will be on your time. If you know people have uh, uh, the habit of uh, reading the newspaper, you know, in the train, uh, in the toilet, uh, in, with a coffee, whatever. So that's their moment, and they can share the, this moment with, in, with this picture, you know, as long as they like. So there's something very intimate, which is very different than you know someone tells you that at eight o'clock you'll sit in front of the TV and you'll see the news, and they, even if there's something pretty strong, I mean, they will not. It's very different than, you know, on your own time looking at, you know, very deeply into a, in sure. a strong image. So you're in, you're in these very dangerous areas. You're in war zones. There's a lot of, pe a lot of things going on. Um, I, I was looking at a bunch of the images last night, the bus, you know, the explosions in the bus. How, as a photographer, how do you continue to shoot? How do you block out or do you block out what's going on around you? <sighs> First of all, there is, there is no way to totally block out. It, it's just impossible. And as a human being, you know, on one hand, you need to be sensitive enough to be able to capture these very emotional moments. And on the other hand, you, are, you have to block something. Otherwise, you cannot you continue do. the next day to wake up in the morning and keep on shooting the way you do. So, Again, there's, you kind of need to balance that. Um, I don't want to lose my sensitivity and not being able to be sensitive enough while I'm shooting because I've been exposed to so much uh, horror you know, th throughout my career. And, and it doesn't have to be like a, you know, a bus bomb or a war situation where you have a lot of dead people. You know, there's, there's so many different situations where you, you, know, you, you go through a very emotional 
thing, you know, while, while you're shooting. And, and I guess at the end of the day, you have to be a very strong person to wake up the next morning and keep on doing this. I think, you know, it's, it's a mission and an obligation much more than a profession. Sure. Uh, in a way. So a majority or, or the major part of what sets you apart from other people is access. You get into shooting places that other people don't. Because um, we talked about that yesterday where you could be in the line with the press, but everybody's going to have the same shot. They may be slightly different, but you talked specifically about you know, shooting with the president uh, for his birthday coming up. Yeah. Did it already happen? It did already happen. It already yeah, happened. Yeah, so it, you, it did happen. Do you want to run through how that all came about? Yeah, I think at, at some point I understood that uh, if I'm standing in the line in a press conference or a handshake or whatever, uh, I'm, it's a waste of time. Um, you know, we kind of uh, bypassed every technical obstacle in, in the cameras, which are great, and you don't need to worry about the focus and the, the, and the light, and everything works, and, the, and it's sharp, and the exposure is great, and you can transmit from the camera. I mean, every technical aspect is pretty much covered. I think that the only thing that really tells or will make a difference nowadays is that you will bring something that nobody else has. I mean, this is where you know, photojournalist should, you know, this is where his work would stand out. Uh, and I can't afford myself to lose time by, you know, shooting pictures that other photographers will have the exact same image. It's not about standing, you know, uh, um, ne one next to the other with the same lens and, and who gets the split second shot. It's about thinking in advance, it's preparing, you know, what the kind of shoot you want to do. And, you know, it's a lot of preparations and, and um, trying to find, you know, the good access to do these things. So I would, in everything that I would photograph, I would think what would be my angle and how can I use my connections or the way I can find my own access to do something which will be different than other photographers. Otherwise, I mean, I'm wasting my time. Sure. You talked about when there was a prisoner release going on, the Israeli photographers showed up there on the one side, but you got there the, the night before you got on the, into the, uh, the occupied... Yeah, I moved in, into Gaza before uh, the, the prisoner release and I waited for them on the other side and then I can travel with them to their homes and the parties and the shooting up in the air, you know, all, all the ceremonies and, and stuff. And uh, so it's, it's very different. It's a, it's a lot about production and See, access. I think it, but I think it's interesting because most of the world doesn't, they don't realize that you're Israeli but you're on the other side there and they're, you're going back to the homes with them and you're fine. Is uh, yeah. respect? Uh, no, <laughs> I mean, in most cases, they don't know I'm an Israeli. On the, okay. on the Palestinian side, I'm, I'm nobody. So it's, uh, and you know, I speak English, I represent an American agency. I mean, I don't expose the fact that I don't speak Hebrew and, and so, and I present myself as an American photographer. Um, wow. So it, it, it works, it works. So what are some of the, you know, I read that you said that no shot is worth dying for. Was that? Yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah. Unless they misquoted for, it. For obvious reasons. Uh, I'm not sure where this quote was really taken from, uh, but for obvious reasons, I mean, I don't think, I, I did put myself in danger so many times in my career that some of the times I came back and I said, this was really stupid. I mean, I shouldn't have done that. Because in most cases, you don't understand how dangerous the situation is until something happens and you're already there and things just happen in front of your face and, and it becomes extremely dangerous. Right. I mean, it's not that, uh, you know, um, it's not like you see in the movies that uh, somebody's running through uh, bullets and things like that. It's not like that. But you go uh, to Ramallah to shoot a, a big rally of Hamas and things go out of control and start shooting everywhere and you find yourself... And this is where you're not prepared, which really is dangerous, where you have no helmet and no bulletproof vest and things just got out of hands and, uh, and you're, you find yourself in a real dangerous situation. I mean, and obviously these things happen. You should be prepared for that. I mean, shit can happen. Absolutely. So on the technical side, I was just curious, you know, we have batteries, we have cards. I don't know, you used to have to change film. I mean, what, how do you continue to do the, not make the mistakes, like I'm out of card space, things like that. What, what is going through your mind when you're out there other than trying not to be in the way? First of all, on daily basis, I mean, I'll give you just a small example. No matter what I shot today 
always the cameras will go back in the same settings to, the, to my camera bag. So if tomorrow something happens and I need to pull the camera and start shooting, I know exactly where to turn the, um, uh, the controllers be before, you know, without thinking, oh, wow, yesterday I shot on a long exposure and I'm still on three seconds or whatever. I mean, sure. so always I know exactly what the setting of the camera when it comes back to my back. And you need to be very kind of um, set in a way. I know, you know, always, it's not just the cameras, you know what? It's not just knowing that the batteries will be in the right place and they're all like in, in, in good shape and, uh, and cards that I would put uh, that are ready if I need to change cards or whatever. It's even I will never go to sleep when the bike is empty of gas. You know, I see it's running down, I will go to refuel because if something happens during the night, I don't get stuck and say, oh, well, you know, what, what, what do we do now? Right. I mean, you, and this is part of being professional, I think. It's experience and being professional. I mean, no matter how good your shot will be, if you run into a problem and you can't transmit your pictures, no matter where you are in the world, you didn't do anything. You're a failure. And I gotta tell you something, I spoke I had a, um, a lunch a while ago with a Stern photo editor, German magazine, um, Stern. And he tells me, you know what, um, you know what's the most important thing in, you know, when working with a photographer? And I told him, you know, being a good photographer, I said, yeah, okay, that's obvious. But, okay, so what's the second thing? I said, okay, you tell me. He said, be easy to work with. You know, because he wants to know that he puts you on assignment and he sends you to Haiti or to India or to Afghanistan or wherever. I mean, he needs to know that he can be confident that the picture will be there on time, that beside the fact that the picture will be good, but if the deadline is one o'clock, so by 12, all the pictures will be on the, on the photo editor's desk. And that he doesn't need to kind of worry and, uh, and be in stress if the pixels will arrive or not. And yeah. if you come and say, listen, I had a problem, you know, you cannot do that. Because he needs to go back to his boss and say, you know, I'm sorry, the picture didn't arrive. You know, you cannot do that. You know, being a professional, you need to deliver. And I can give you a good example. While we were shooting um, the disengagement from Gaza. I need to kind of think how this is going to happen. I mean, I don't know how I'm going to be able to transmit because they were not only taking out the settlements, they were taking down the, um, all the um, cell phone. Uh, they were just bulldozing. Ev out. Everything was taken down. So, but I need to transmit somehow. I don't know how long I will be without uh, uh, electricity. I mean, so I had a Pelican. And the computer was inside with uh, another two batteries for the computer, another batteries for other stuff that I would probably need. I, I was putting um, all the different cell phones, the Israeli cell phones. I had three different lines of cell phones having the ability to transmit, plus a satellite phone. Right. And uh, an inverto that I can take power out of a battery of a Jeep with uh, crocodiles, you know. Yep. So if something runs out and I'm... I don't have uh, batteries or anything. So you need to really sit here and think, okay, what, what's gonna, what can possibly happen? And I need to react and, and to find a solution and say, okay, I'm going to have this and that ready in case. On one hand, you know, you cannot carry 200 uh, kilos of, of gear. I mean, obviously, I can, you know, it can, if you have your own car, that's easy. I mean, uh, but if you don't, you're, you're traveling with the soldiers that are coming to pull out the people, and it's, it, it, wasn't, it was impossible to travel with your own car. So everything that, ha that fits a medium-sized pelican can, can get in, uh, but not more than that. So you need to kind of calculate in terms of size, in terms of weight, in terms of what needs to be in that pelican that will save you, that uh, no matter what happens, you will not call your editor saying, you know, I'm sorry, I fucked up, I can't transmit or whatever. So, being in Haiti, everything is sh totally shut down, and I go with an open laptop um, in, in the area of the airport, because there are a lot of uh, international uh, televisions there and so on, to try to find the, where, the I, where I can find Wi-Fi. I was, you know, uh, just walking for hours, and then, okay, I found a place that I have Wi-Fi, send a picture, the, everything was ready, but I had no way to, to kind of transmit. So, you need to be um, 
Yeah, we are running out of time. Yeah, <laughs> your your camera is running out of time. So you're so, ready. You're ready. You're prepared for everything. That's the thing. Cool. Be prepared for everything. So being a can, it's a Canon Explorer of Light. Is that what they call it? Uh, ambassador. Ambassador. Exactly. I have to get it right. The, the Canon's gonna. They yell at me for using the Nikon <laughs> anyway. But hey, what can we do? Nobody's so, perfect, you know. You, you're a cool guy, but you still, you know, you need to kind of progress. No, I used the One DX. <laughs> I borrowed the One DX when it came out. Uh, fantastic. I mean, obviously, a fantastic camera. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what we shoot with. Exactly. You could walk out yeah. with your iPhone and go get some great stuff. I, I agree. I agree with that. I remember uh, once I had a kind of a debate about film with another photographer. And uh, he was saying, you know, this film is better. No, this film is better. We were kind of debating on which film would be better for the assignment. And then he told me, you know what, to be honest, I don't remember ever that someone came up to me and say, you know, if this was shot on a different film, it would have been a better picture. You know, when a picture works, it works. We're in the same ball game today with gear. Exactly. People are like, well, what'd you shoot that with? But, but that doesn't matter. Yeah. It, it's not yeah, the gear. I, I totally it's, agree. It, it's the images that you're capturing. It doesn't matter. Um, I agree. So that's, we face that every day now. And, but film, you talked about film yesterday. You talked about the Fuji Press 800. I used to yeah, buy that, that by the brick. That, that was my favorite, yeah. It was great because it would push a stop to, to almost two stops. And it was still pretty good. For, for the day, the <laughs> yeah. grain, the, the, which people yeah. don't understand. I mean, now you're pushing your 1DX and which you were the first, how did you end up being the first person to have a 1DX uh, to test? Um, I kind of um, persuade Canon to uh, give me the prototype camera for a project I've done in South Africa with the Red Cross. And now Canon are supporting the Red Cross. So it kind of came about that I told them, you know, to be good that I will do this project with a new camera. Then, you know, you can show a real project that is being done, not just in a laboratory testing in, in Japan, but a real kind of reportage. Well, were you all right using a, the only camera that existed to go out and capture your images? I think that if it would have been done, I mean, if the project was in Europe, they wouldn't let me. But because it was Africa, you know, to in KwaZulu Natal, they said, you know, okay, so it was all full of gaffer tape and it was the first camera. It, actually, it was the third. It says 00003. Wow. It was a handmade. Hand put it and, yeah, it, and yeah. it worked. And it, it performed amazingly well. well yeah. Did it shoot raw yet? Yes. And I, it, I couldn't open it. You couldn't the raw open file. them for, for probably yeah. a year. Uh, yeah, it, it took a while. It took a couple of months uh, before I got um, the ability to open the raw files. But I came back and I've done an exhibition uh, with the pictures I've done and sh from the JPEGs. Mm -hmm. Big enlargements over a meter each, and it, it came out great. Now, since you mentioned JPEG, um, how have the RAWs, uh, do they just, you like having the ability to, to have all the data with the RAW files? I think it, it's, I can divide that into two things. I mean, the first would be, yes, obviously it has much more data and it's a, you know, it's a file that you can really uh, produce um, a higher quality or b a bigger file size uh, image by all means. But I think that for me, far more important is the fact that this is your insurance policy. This tells you that this is the original, first of all. True. And this is how it was originally shot. I mean, that the, the image is not manipulated, and, and this is exactly the way how it came out of, from the camera. I think this is something, and I'll tell you another secret. We have um, a roundtable discussion once a year, as you mentioned, with the Canon ambassadors and the top engineers from Tokyo. And one of the things that I tried to push, uh, because one of the things that we talk about is what we want to do in future projects or, or see in the next models of cameras. I cannot expose uh, anything, but I will say something that I talked about. Um, I think that, uh, and one of the things I, I mentioned, that I think that they should make uh, in the XC file an unaccessible thumbnail of the original image that will show even in JPEG. So you cannot access it. It's, not, it's exactly like uh, the, where you have the, all the um, um, exposure and uh, f-stop and all the things that tells you how the picture was made. Uh, but to have an unaccessible thumbnail that when, as a photo editor, you know, I judge in many contests. So sometimes I get images that don't look right. I mean, I want the ability to access the original file in that's the embedded. Exif, that's exactly that's embedded in the exif file, 
and see what the original picture looks like, even in JPEG. Well, just to have it, just so you know where it, where it started and that... I think that this will have um, a major part in, in, in talking about credibility, exactly like we've seen uh, last year with the WordPress photo. Uh, you know, there was a big debate if the picture... Okay, so it wasn't... It was manipulated in a way. The question was if it was a legit uh, manipulation or not. Right. I mean, where does the border go exactly? I mean, because adding 10% of, of contrast is legit. But adding 90% of contrast, we're getting into the gray zone if it's legit or not. I mean, well, there the, are no grays when you get to 90%. It's just blacks and whites. Yeah, no, yeah. I, no, I, I agree, but you know, I'm not, that's, that's the no, contrast. But there are some tools that, you know, playing in the, in the, in the average zone of, of in between uh, 5 to 15% makes sense. But going over that is already turning the picture into something different than the view that you saw when you were taking the well, picture. Well, what do you think about Ansel, somebody like, you go back to Ansel Adams. I don't know if, you, if it still applies, but how much post-production was done in the darkroom back then, it was still the, like he took a raw file and just started tweaking things and, and, and came out with something totally different than he captured. It's true. Um, first of all, in, in landscape photography, I think uh, it's more legit than doing that. Uh, you know, in, in the art world, obviously everything is acceptable. Right. I think that the only kind of narrow alley that we really need to, co to consider is it's photojournalism. I mean, and then again, you know, if you, if the, if you have a, a title saying that the picture was uh, manipulated or d gone through a massive uh, Photoshop effect and so on, I mean, that's fine. You, you, can, you, you can do anything with the picture you want. I mean, it's yours. Yeah. Uh, but showing it as if it's, uh, it should kind of um, tells you what, the, the, what you brought from the field um, and you manipulated to make a better picture or, or for the colors to be better or, uh, or in anything, you know, take something out of the picture because the picture is not perfect or something. I mean, this is totally wrong. Sure. So, so what has been being an ambassador done for you? For Canon? First of all, I have to admit it's a dream job. Honestly, I mean, uh, having the ability to get all the equipment, most, most of the equipment I use is um, before it's even launched um, to test it and to kind of write a report on it and you know, give my feedback on um, what I would I like to see different or how better it is than previous models or what do I want to change for the next model and so on. So this is something that is it's, it's, it's fun honestly. And um, it's a good connection. Um, it's a great honor to be among a group of um, the best photographers. Sure. Um, and um, so I travel and give lectures in Canon events, uh, talking about my work and talking about projects I've done. Um, if it's like shooting in extreme low light conditions, so it could be a bit technical on one hand and how I shoot and, and on the other hand show stories that I've been, you know, personal work that I've been working on. So it gives me a, um, it's a great honor. Uh, and, and it's really cool to have uh, the ability to express my thoughts about uh, the new gear and um, share that with a group of very, you know, interesting people. It also gives you an opportunity to say, hey, I'm going to go to this cool place. You guys want to be a part of it. Yeah, I mean, that, that works as well. I mean, uh, I think that uh, Canon are very supportive uh, to their um, ambassadors. Um, There's only 12, right? Yeah, there are 12 ambassadors in, in Europe. Okay. okay, so Canon is a company that is divided into three. So there's Canon Inc., which is Japan in the Far East. There is Canon Europe, which is Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And Canon USA, which is both Americas. Uh, so it's like divided into three different units. Uh, so I represent Canon Europe because I'm part of that region. It works differently in the US. I mean, they have some other system for, for their photographers. Uh, but in Europe, there are 12 ambassadors that sure. are um, active. So if you could uh, make your dream camera, you know, hypothetically make your dream camera, what, what would be in it? Or what would it do? I guess it would be based on the DX. Um, it will have a slightly bigger file and it will be smaller. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, uh, um, mirrorless DX with uh, 40 megapixel uh, and the size of um, even smaller than a 5D. <laughs> nice, nice. That would be that would be a very interesting camera. I'm sure. They're I, I, don't, I don't need on. a faster camera. I mean, it's 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 even too fast for me. I mean, I, it's, I, I, it's fast. It is, and I don't shoot sport. I mean, it's not something that I, that I do. Um, so. In most cases, maybe I will switch it to fast mode once or twice a year if I'm sh in, in military things that I know I have a cannon being shot or something sure. and I will try to capture it or something. But rather than that, I don't need uh, the camera to be as fast as the DX. I would give that in return to a bigger file size. Nice. Did, have, have you seen the movie Walter Mitty? No. No. It, it, when you do, if you ever get time. It, it's kind of like you're the photographer in it. it, 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 it it's photography based and it, it, it's pretty interesting. Okay. If you haven't seen it, I don't, I don't want to spoil or alert it for you, but uh, it, it's one of those things I would check out. Okay, Because I it, will. as a photojournalist, I think you will really latch on to it. So it was definitely cool. We good there? How much time? Eight. Eight, cool. So um, anything that you want, I, I know that you teach a lot or you lecture a lot. Is there anything yeah. you want to say to people? At home, just uh, some, some words of wisdom. Uh, this whole thing was words of wisdom, so I don't <laughs> want to go there. Uh, no, I, really, just thank you for having us here. I, would, I think I would add one thing for um, newcomers in, in uh, the photography world. I think that um, putting aside the technical side and try to think of finding your own voice, and uh, it's true that it became a profession that is harder to make a living from than in the past, but I think you should be more creative and, and there's, there's always room for talented people and um, do your, give it your best shot. Cool. Zip, thank you. Pleasure is all mine. Toda <laughs> roba. So that is Ziv Koren. How awesome of a guy is he? He is just a smooth operator smooth he, operator he had one of those sumo books i don't think we talked about it in the interview the giant books one of the giant books it, it was two series those are the five that i think he paid about four grand for it Whew. but it literally came in like a military uh wood case with this what ammunition and, and munitions <laughs> would come in you got to get like a crowbar no, to crack it open basically it had a guy ca help him carry it in it's that heavy it's one of, i forget the photographer's name santos or something but can you see it in the video Keep in mind, I um, no, it's not in the background. No, it's not in the background. Okay, um, because I was shooting towards the uh, the, the pool table. The you can see his photo wall. He has all those photos on the wall that were gifts from people. And um, he has like a bookshelf. He right? has a beautiful bookshelf <laughs> that you which, envy. <laughs> well, I took pictures of all his. I took pictures of the shelf so I could see all his books. Cool. So I can order them because I want to have. I, I showed him. I'm like, that's great. He loves books. He loves the photo books. He's like, people don't buy these books anymore. And, and I told him about the from my bookshelf, and he's like, that's awesome. But he emailed me when I got home. He was oh, really we, nice. Yes, we, we had an instant connection for whatever reason. Either that or he's just a really nice guy, and everybody in Israel says he's just a really nice guy. I, I thought it was great. He, he was worried about the cigarette smoking in it. He's like, the Americans, they don't maybe like uh, the cigarette smoking. I'm like, dude, that, that's you. That makes it. This is who you are. Don't Go ahead. It. You yeah. can smoke. I don't mind. You I mean, I, do, I don't like smoke, but... I knew that it would it's look good. It's his place. That's him. Yeah. It, we were in his office. He has a he has a literal he has a huge safe that he keeps a lot of his old negatives in. He has two computers set up. One is not connected to the internet that has like forty seven terabytes of data. The Israeli uh, military or whoever came in because he shoots top secret stuff for them. So it, just in they case they came yeah. in to make sure that he had uh, security there. Uh, he has a security gate. He has cameras. It's it's it's. Hi, here's a, I'm gonna install Norton antivirus on your machine. It's so. protected. <laughs> He's got one connected to the internet and one not. That's great. So he has two setups because none of that stuff can be seen. It's it's top secret stuff. Um, That's a great idea though, just to have that one machine, especially if you're a photojournalist like that. Oh, and not guess, connected. Speaking of chair talk, chair talk. This he, week he has chair an, talk. he has a uh, Herman Miller chair. Does he? And then I told him about the Embody. Which kind does he have? He has the Arion. The it's one I have. Arion. It's uh, Arion. It's similar to yours. Okay. It's older. But those are meant to last 15, 20 years. Yeah. But I told him about the chair I sit in, and he's going to go look it up. The, the, the video that you just did? Well, I'll, I'll send it to him. I'll send it to him. But we, I sent him I Shoot Raw stuff. He only wears black. So I'm sending him a bunch of shirts and a bunch of patches. All black everything. He's like, send me some stickers. Send me patches. I'll put them on things. That's awesome. 
awesome guy. So and he shoots raw. I'm assuming. Oh, he shoots raw. Yeah, nice. you haven't you haven't seen the interview yet. No, Everybody I else has seen, seen it. The yeah, interview. because keep in mind, I haven't edited this yet. <laughs> I yeah, just I just got gave the file it, from you like yesterday. Yesterday, I gave you the files. Yeah. Um, yeah, he shoots raw. He doesn't crop. Headshots from the top. He knows his f stops like criminals. No <laughs> cops. He doesn't use flash to make his color pops. He relies on natural lighting and the Photoshop. Screw Mercedes Benz. I got the biggest lens and only shoot with. He shoots with Canon. Did um, you? Uh, yeah, right. C A N O. But you saw that little intro I showed you where he's like, "What is this? A Nika?" And then I cut it off real quick. <laughs> you may, if that works, it was cool because he says, "I like it that he says his name." Hey, it's Ziv Karen, and I'm awesome blah, blah, name blah. by the way. Yeah. Ziv. Ziv. So badass sounding. Anyway, so awesome interview. And that brought up like wanting to travel the world yeah. and going to these other photographers' places and interviewing them. And obviously you going. And then Mobile I would World need, Talk. Yeah, Global World. Did you say Global? Mobile. Oh, Mobile global World Talk. Too. Global. Those Atomoses would come in handy. F and V lights would come in handy. I would need a tour manager to take care of things. Dude, that's one thing Set that, it all up, yeah. that helped us in Israel was having... Uh, this one guy, Ayal, who was awesome. He was ex-military. Photog- he became a photographer. Uh, when something happened, he doesn't want me to talk about what happened in the, in the, in the, in the army. But um, he got into the cab. You know, you, you know how you pick up a cab here and you don't talk to the guy yeah. or the girl, whoever? I actually Typically, really haven't sometimes it. Some of them, they talk, but the, the more talk to us, yeah. American ones do. Yeah. Um, that's, and that's not true. saying that all don't, but... They're always on the phone. I don't know if you ever yeah, noticed. They're always on the phone, but always talking in to Israel, they're not. They have to be hands-free. But That's when good. we got into a cab, something like Uber, it's like call taxi now or something. And Ayal and this guy were talking like they were the best of friends and they've never met. And I think the camaraderie out of Israel is incredible because everybody had to go into the army. Everybody had to see the other side. Everybody has to. They're all there as brothers and sisters because they're all there for this the protection of this, this country, their, their way of life, what they what they've built. And just seeing the interactions, it's. Everybody is so, uh, I can say nice, but just accepting. Yeah. And also Tel Aviv is the center for the most accepting for gay uh, people. Oh, wow. In the world, I believe. Even outranked San Francisco. Wow. So it just, anyway, but I just thought it was cool. Ayal and, and it, what I'm saying is it'd be great to have a tour manager, no matter where we go, to have a local that speaks the language, that knows where you need to go and helps you get there. But a tour manager to set everything up and to organize that yeah. stuff. All right. Let's get into gear of the week because I'm starting to lose my voice. Um, gear of the week. I've got a bunch of stuff. It looks like Black Rapid decided to come up out, come out with two new straps that I got in orange. Oh, they got orange now? Yeah, one's called the cross shot, which is similar to the ones that we currently use, and the other is called the shot. I think it's shorter. Let me just open the cross shot real fast because it's different. It's flyers colors, orange and black. That's like your favorite colors. Yeah, they got rubber, which is it's like a tire on your arm, so it's sli- it's different than before. Is that supposed to be the grip? Wow. This is the grip, so it's I don't know if it does it stretch. Nope, doesn't really stretch. This is the first time I've taken it out of the box, by the way. Smells like Oops, rubber. Just it the says box. Black Rapid on the side. I just hope they don't come out with a red one. I have to try this out. I love the orange, by the way. Yeah, that's... that's I that, saw that, the prototype when I was in Seattle the last time. That is Flyers Orange, for sure. So it's like a tire. I don't know if it... if it. I like the thicker pad, so this isn't as thick. But obviously, they're trying something different, and we'll have to... This uh, one looks exactly the same. It's shorter. Oh, it's definitely shorter, and it doesn't have uh, the stops either. Yeah, it doesn't have the uh, these things. Is the sliders. Oh, this is really short. Yeah, it's just for... I don't know what it's for. But anyway, that's one piece of gear. You guys can do some research on their website. <laughs> I like the grip, though. It I, does I actually, like the grip. I wonder, is it this way with like the tires down or no, is no, it no. that way? I think the tires... When you say tires, the Black Rapid rubber goes against yeah, your shoulder. That's what I mean. And then, yeah. the, then the, this stuff is sticking out. Okay, that makes sense. Oh, look, it even has this. I wonder why they went orange and black. You know, wow. not their their classic gold and uh, black color. Well, speaking of Nikon gold, color, you there's know? a Nikon strap. And by the way, Black Rapid makes the Nikon strap. And I think that somebody didn't have the balls to make it all yellow. Remember how I fought to make fought to make mine all red? Yeah. Like they said no. I right? like the red over, and I'm I'm a Nikon shooter, but I like the red over the Nikon strap. And second off, Cannon the Nikon red. strap is ninety nine dollars. It's twenty dollars more than my freaking strap. It's not as nice as mine either. Is that because they have their name on it? Probably because it says Nikon, and they probably had to pay full price for it. And then they want to go and make it an extreme. Anyway, let's throw that on the floor. <laughs> Watch my... You, you hit my seashell. My bad. Uh, 
Oh, I have two. I have two more. Don't things. throw that on the floor. I'm not going to throw this. <laughs> I came home to missing a DHL package twice, so I got it resent out, and it was this Rode. It's not even out yet. The NT USB. It's a. This is a condenser microphone. Yes. So it's meant for recording music, USB acoustic more. Yeah. It's not the podcaster, which is primarily meant for podcasting, podcasting for yeah. audio. This is meant to give you probably more boomified. You can see the capsule inside. Uh, it's not even out. They don't even have it on their website. So, do you want to take it home and play with it? Sure. Or you, is that all right? Yeah, I I don't mind because you like testing this stuff out. Yeah. So and like, I have the NT two A, which I don't even know if they sell anymore, but that was from a couple of years back. NT USB not out, but it's going to be one hundred and ninety nine bucks, I believe. Comes with the the road uh, screen right up here on the front. And <gasps> what does it smell like? <laughs> oh, let me let me give it a smell. It smells like oh, it's so hard to say, but that's such a good smell. Made in Australia. Hmm. You can't put. It your, just smells new. I can't put my nose on it. You know what it smells kinda, good though. You, but you know what it also smells like? It reminds me of anesthesia. To anybody that's ever been put under by the 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 gas, it has that pungent odor that remind. I used to be scared of that odor because really? it put me to sleep. But anyway, that's and the, the last thing is Road has two more weeks left in there to upload into the contest at what is the website? MyRoadReel.com. M Y R O D E R E E L dot com. Again, eighty thousand dollars worth of prizes, including some F and V lighting and a whole lot of other stuff. So put that down. You'll keep that for now. I'll let you take that home. Yeah. What's but, funny, just before you move on, is that it looks like this almost doubles as like a, a an audio interface because it has all the knobs directly on the mic itself, it, it, including a headphone jack. Well, it's which latency is rare. free audio. But there's that latency th free. That's nice. Yeah. The one thing I don't understand, it has that one knob between the computer and the yeah, microphone. I don't understand that either. I don't know if that means you can. Oh, I know what it means. Can, I think I know what it you means. You can mix the computer sound with. Yes. Yeah. Which, which is something that I need. Well, for you when you're doing. Pod, when I'm doing Twitter stuff. Screenshots. Right. Stuff. That is something that would come in really Screen handy that stuff. you could mix it. Oh, I didn't realize that's what it was. Yeah, so all I right. guess you can turn all the way the, the, yeah, the so microphone. Yeah. So you wouldn't hear any computer. It up. Or you would it. hear a computer. Yeah. Last thing. Wasabi Power. Wasabi is a third is a manufacturer of third party batteries. They emailed me and said, "We know that you have the GoPro, and it's still blinking up there. Oh, that's good. And uh, <laughs> how are we doing over here? Good. We know that you have the GoPro. We want to send you out a, a two batteries and a charger. So twenty two ninety nine gets you two GoPro Hero three or three plus batteries plus a dual charger. Wow. USB power. That is inexpensive it's very inexpensive and you know i've been against third-party batteries for like my d4 i'm not sure i would put a third-party battery in my d4 yeah i'm not sure i got you some batteries for the 5d mark three we can try them out uh i got some for the d610s we can try them out uh they told me they're not made in china where are they made the cells are made in japan and then it's assembled in china <laughs> But the cells are made in Japan. Okay. So the batteries are made in Japan. Yeah. Uh, but they're assembled in China. But the rapid charger is awesome because I have so much trouble charging it's so them. It's so tiny. You just plug it in. Yeah, three inches and three, <laughs> center, uh, three ounces. Um, That's what Sutter's girlfriend You plug said. it in. It charges. We're testing them out. Do you guys have any experience with third-party batteries? Have you had good experience? Have you had bad experience? I know that Hing uses Wasabi Power for his F&V lightings. They have third-party stuff. So they make stuff. almost any type of battery, it seems Adam, like. I didn't know this, but Adam has his X100S, mm -hmm. and he uses a Wasabi charger more than he uses... He leaves the, the Fuji one at home and takes the Wasabi charger. I've never even heard that. of that brand until you showed me the other day. I think they're pretty well-known on, on I, Amazon. I used to use a third party bat, two third-party batteries for my 5D Mark III grip, and they died so much faster, and they didn't hold a charge nearly as long as my Canon and we'll LPE test it out. 6 batteries. We'll test it out. Yeah. Because I, you know... It wasn't the, this brand. I don't even know what brand it was. The only way to know if the, we like the stuff or if it's good is to use it. Yeah. It's time for the Wheel of Froze, Stephen. Oh, I got to put it up. You got to put it up. You got to get it up this time, because Sutter isn't able to be here. Oh, God. Look how dusty it got while I was away. No, it's, al it's always been that dusty. This is all the, the wood... Uh, the sawdust from when your apartment was getting all done. Oh, that looks good. I see it on the screen. There you go. Wow. We can sit here and actually see the screen. Yeah, this time we don't have to actually get up and really look. That, um, that Ninja Blade is really 
Really something. So we didn't have a wheel of throw this week, so I'm going to spin it this week. We've got on their borrow lens. It's $250 in rentals. Squarespace. Go to fro, uh, squarespace.com slash fro. Get 10% off your first order, uh, which could be a year. Lexar. Maybe they'll give away a hub. Adorama picks. Metal prints. Books. Uh, Fronos photo beginner guides. Question mark. Road microphones. We've landed on that the last time. Think tank photo, which hooked me up with some bags to go away with to Israel. Hooked Adam up with some bags. Uh, Simon was there. And they're going to hook up Ziv, I think, with some bags because he needs some think tank nice. bags. Uh, road, blah, 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 blah. Bar lenses. I think that's everybody. Oh, I forgot. Black Rapid is on there. <laughs> I still haven't fixed that. So spinning this week. I'm not telling you who. Let's spin the wheel. Hold on. That's a good spin. Around and round it goes where it stops. No wheel. Oh, bro. I had to do my sutter. And here it comes on the... Oh, this is a question mark. This is a question mark. It's not a question mark. And it's still going on. That says Black Rapid, right? Uh, Adorama. No, no, no. It's crossed out and it says Black Rapid. Oh. <laughs> yeah. All it right, you can take. Rabbit. Go ahead, take it off the table. We're <laughs> gonna try to do this before the end of the show. Um, so congratulations, Justin Connors. Justin Connors, you have won a Black Rapid strap. I will contact you and them, and hopefully you don't already have one. Maybe they'll send you one of the new ones. Yeah. The shot. The long shot. The, was it the cross shot and the shot? No, it's the shot and the long shot. Is it? I think. I don't know. <laughs> we threw them on the floor already. The shots. All right. I think we've come to the end of the show. It's very be long, a long one. Very long show. I know I talked a lot about the whole Israel thing. That was my most, it was my, the best trip I've ever been on. It's great. Felt relaxed, enjoyed it. Great people, made some cool photos, made some cool content there. What? Are you making sure it's in? Everything's good. All right. Yeah, we always want to make sure everything's good. Uh, it was very enjoyable. I really appreciate them offering this trip up, uh, making it fun. And just, it was, it was a, I'm not going to say once in a lifetime opportunity because I can do it again and anybody else can do it and, and check it out. Thank you to Ziv Koren for his, uh, inter taking the time to sit down and have an interview and do a photo shoot with Adam. Interview was spectacular. Very interesting guy. Check out his books and, um, want to thank Rode Microphones for hooking me up with the new roads and want to thank Adamos. I can't wait to get this Ninja Star so that I can travel with them and we can start traveling the world. It would be great for us to do something like that. I would love to do it. I've right. still never been outside the U.S. You have a passport? Uh, I do not yet, Dude. actually. Will you go I to never CBS? went outside the U.S. Will you go? You need a passport right now. I know. Now. I'll, I'll get one now. Right now. I never had a reason to get one. Right. You go get your passport made down the street or at CVS or wherever you need to I'll go. I'll go to Indie Photo and get the passport. That's what photo. I said. How much time is You're on there? You're fine. Uh, go get your passport made. Apply for it. It's going to take a couple weeks, but we're going to start doing this yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's usually man. six weeks I think it takes. We, we're going to start doing this. All right. You need to be ready. I'll do it to now. To go. I'm gonna. I'm going now. You're gonna going go now. do it. All right. So thank you guys for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. Check out fronosphoto.com slash podcast. Sorry, podcast. You can get everything or fronosphoto.com slash raw talk hyphen eighty six to get all of these photo news stories and more. And um, I think that's it. Jared Poland fronosphoto.com. See ya.